The Unofficial X-Files, Volume 3. Written by Eni Genge and read by Bob Sherman. Side 1. All new truths begin as heresies and end as superstitions. We fear the unknown, so we reduce it to the terms that are most familiar to us, whether that's a folk tale or a disease or a conspiracy. Science may advance and faith recede, but when special agents Dana Scully and Fox Mulder combine their skepticism and curiosity in pursuit of the truth, diggers in the X-Files can expect surprises. In X-File 4X04101896, codename Toleco, myth and medicine clash, when the two agents investigate the deaths of young black men in Philadelphia, the bodies, stripped of essential chemicals, appear more the victims of disease than foul play, at least to the Center for Disease Control and to Scully. Mulder isn't so sure, and while Scully hunts down a medical demon, Mulder searches for a much more literal one that so far remained hidden in the realms of folklore. Ask twenty children what's lurking beneath their beds when the lights go out, and you'll immediately be swamped with twenty versions of the bogeyman. Like crime scene witnesses, no two children will be able to provide matching descriptions of this cryptozoological oddity, but as any two kids will also tell you, the details don't matter in the dark. So what if North American bogeymen are green, with a tendency to sliminess, while their compatriots in Norway wrap themselves in the blacks and greys of night and have disjoint arms and legs that look and feel like old roots and tree branches. It's what they do, not what they look like, that makes them bogeymen. Regardless of their hometown, bogeymen have one responsibility, namely to grab the ankles of unwary little children silly enough to creep from under their covers. And luckily for children everywhere, even if their parents have neglected to educate their offsprings on the hazards of creatures living under beds, there's always someone able and willing to pass the story on to those who don't want to go to sleep. Like the bogeyman who crosses language and political borders with equal ease, there's a West African figure that, though known by a multitude of names, also serves a singular purpose. Whether he's called Sumabra, the Kinto Loat, the Web Walker, or the Gaddy Defant, the white body and soul snatchers have been striding through African mythology since African coastal communities were first raided to provide slaves for the labor-poor New World. The Gaddy Defant still makes his appearances in stories from Haiti and Puerto Rico. According to legend, he was a ghostly presence, paler than ivory, capable of snatching away the children of mothers who failed to closely supervise them. He swept up and down the coast in his ghost ship, adding to his hoard whenever possible. The shrieks heard during storms were, of course, the unending lament of his victims who were doomed never to return to their homeland. The Gaddy Defant seldom appeared in daylight, preferring to hide his white face until darkness concealed him. He could hide in the smallest crevice, and the women were encouraged to sweep out every nook of their homes during the bright daylight hours when the Gaddy Defant was at his weakest, then remain vigilant through the night to prevent his return. The Sumabra of Gabon could easily provide the model for yet another part of the story Mulder recounts to Scully to explain the Telico that takes up residence in Philadelphia in this X-File. Hunting in packs and described as hordes in most of the children's stories, the Sumabra would descend on the village they'd targeted, running around at a great speed, creating a mighty gale to prevent anyone from escaping, and then darting in and out as individuals to carry off whichever members of the tribe took their fancy. Those lost quickly turned as pale as their captors, and would even begin raiding their former homes and leading their new masters deeper into the interior to ravage neighboring villages. The legends also warned children of Sumabran villages to be found deep in the hills or hidden in the darkest parts of the forests. Unlike the Sumabra themselves, their villages, usually found deserted, were delightful. Succulent meals simmered over cooking fires. Verdant garden patches promised plenty of food for the future. Stores of honey lured greedy children into sturdy homes. Music floated on the air in Sumabra's glades. At nightfall, however... Things changed swiftly. 
The music turned to moans, the honey to bitter tree sap, and as the Sumabra roared up from crevices in the ground, a choking stench accompanied them, and the plentiful food rotted before the terrified visitors' eyes as the Sumabra began their vicious hunt again. In both the Gaddy Defant and the Sumabra tales, the thieving spirits were forced to take solid, basically human shapes before claiming their victims. In another African myth, the web crawlers, while fitting all the classic elements of a slaver story, are unique for their startling portrayal of the slaver as a massive, bloated spider that lures children deeper into the forests by leaving sweet drops of a honey-like substance trailing behind it. Once the naive child is too far away to attract an adult's attention, thick strands of webbing drop from above, quickly followed by the spider who flings a larger section of prepared webbing over the child before bundling up the struggling youngster to add to its larder. The only hint of these creatures' human roots is found in the bleach head each spider spirit will have hanging from somewhere on its body. Horrid as the web crawlers seem, an even more horrific creature stalks West Africa's oral folklore, the Kinto Loat. This pale, wraith-like killer appears as a skeleton loosely covered by pale skin that rustles with each movement. Paler hair floats out around its bony shoulders. Watery blue eyes paralyze its victims. Quills, which spit from its mouth, carry poison, and once caught, there's no escape for its miserable victims. Just as a child cares little for the color of its own bogeymen, however, the particulars of any region's Toliko don't really matter. What does matter to the cultures who create the myth and to those who study them in an attempt to understand human experience are the consistencies among the versions. Slaving occurred over hundreds of miles of coastline, affected dozens of disconnected social groups, yet its history was, compared to the long African oral history, relatively short. Still, the slaver legends persist, even in the absence of raiders following their creators to Haiti, Puerto Rico, Jamaica, and, of course, the United States. In every case, the enemy, the alien, the other, is visibly different from the population he ravages. Pale skin, blonde hair, and eyes with pupils that remain visible even at a distance all provide stark contrast to the West African populations who produce them. While even such exceedingly rare traits would occasionally arise from naturally occurring albinism, tales of white monsters remained scarce until a concrete enemy in the form of Western Europeans began regular raids. Yet, by almost immediately integrating this new threat into their existing mythos, many communities presented a remarkably concerted defense in short order, much to the invader's surprise. Given a choice between an already hardened target and a less prepared village, slavers would raid a little further afield rather than waste time and effort on more vigilant tribes. And despite the seemingly fantastic abilities attributed to the various Tolikos, most tales are firmly rooted in fact. The slavers could sweep ahead of the winds with boats capable of easily outstripping the primitive sea-going vessels of the native West African population. The tactics attributed to the Suma Bra with minor differences do indeed reflect several of the ways slavers separated villagers from one another. One was quietly to sneak into the woods surrounding a village where they'd make sufficient noise to seriously alarm a sleeping community, while effectively hiding the number of attackers. As the village rushed from side to side to meet an attack that quickly melted back into the woods, slavers on the opposite side would dart in and grab the unprotected. Even the Sumabran villages take on some semblance of reality when you realize that in cases where outright kidnappings wouldn't do, some slavers set up trading posts, which were little more than fronts to lure the trusting locals away from the immediate vicinity of their homes. Even the spider silk thrown by the web crawlers bears an uncanny resemblance to the net some slavers used to entangle groups of Africans until several kidnappers could sort out which of the group they wanted. That the Kinto Loat should appear the most horrific of all the monsters is likely to come as no surprise either. As the Kinto Loat represented in folktale, the all-too-real turncoats who, for pay, would lead the slavers to villages that might otherwise have been passed by. Well, every culture has its spirits and its legends, and the X-Files are full of cases that seem to be drawn from the deep wells of world mythology. In X-File 4X1202-1697, codename Kaddish, 
A series of apparent hate crimes brought Mulder and Scully to one of New York City's ethnic communities, where an acidic Jew, violently murdered, is being implicated in the deaths of his attackers. The contradiction has Scully groping for explanations that nearly defy even Mulder's range of extreme possibilities, until the Judaic text bursts into flame and Mulder begins gathering evidence that a creature out of folklore has come to life. Creation stories connect all people, all cultures, all histories. At some point, various groups of human beings looked at one another, at the world around them, and wondered, how did we come to be? In many ways, it was asking questions, curious thoughts put into words that defined us as human. Nearly all creation stories share something in common, the belief that humanity comes from the mud of this world, and that it is imbued with life only by some divine spark. The story of the golem is a morality play, a creation story, history, philosophy, alchemy, and theology all rolled into one. In the earliest instances of the story, when Abraham and his teacher Shem, the son of Noah, studied the Shefa Yetzirah, they discovered a series of hidden meanings within the phrases and numbers, and in deciphering these hidden truths, realized that their meditations and contemplations of the meanings brought them closer to an understanding of the divine, to understanding creation itself. Though their study led them to animate a calf, not a man, the calf was whole and complete, and the reader is given to understand that at that moment of creation they could as easily have brought planets and universes into being. Heavy stuff. When Abba ben Rav Hama, better known as Rava, took up his studies of the mystical book, he began his meditations with the Rabbi Zira, and between them the two men appear to have achieved a level of understanding equal to Abraham and Shem's, because after many years they too animated a calf, nor were they alone. Study and meditation guided many historic figures toward the book of creation as they sought a closer communion with their creator. Rabbis Hanina and Hoshea took the study of the Shefer Yetzirah seriously and regularly resulting in a habitual diet of young calf for their Sabbath suppers. But human beings, being human, couldn't see calves as the pinnacle of achievement. If, as the Talmud and Koran suggested, any golem created by a person would remain incomplete, incapable of speech, without the input of a deity. Or well, how would an animated calf really differ from an ordinary calf? It seems the same question presented itself to Rava as well and before long he turned from livestock to the creation of a human golem. Now, like all creation tales, this one comes complete with the possibility of ruin, as well as the expectation of power. Golems weren't just elaborate mud pies, though without soul they were expected to take on the characteristics and purpose of their maker. Caution after caution warned students of the absolute necessity for a purity of purpose and of the dozens of small errors in spirit as well as physical form that could result in the creation of a monster. Foremost among the list of do-nots was a prohibition against individuals attempting to breathe life into the clay creatures. While a group engaged in active study could provide some protection for its members, a single person might easily find himself a victim of his own hidden and unacknowledged desires. Unfortunately, Rava ignored the strictures of the Schaefer Yetzirah, and when he had created his human golem, he sent it immediately to the home of his former colleague, Rabbi Zira, who apparently accepted it as a genuine man, until he tried to speak with it, and found that the man sent by Rava was without speech. Language, the highest human attribute, alerted Rabbi Zira to the fact that this man wasn't a man at all, and it was with language Return to dust, that Zira dismissed Rava's creation. That Rava would study the Schaefer yet Zira alone, particularly the sections on golem creations, remains as something of an oddity in Judaic tradition, and perhaps explains the easy way Zira deconstructed it. That Rava would send it to Zira in the first place, however, makes perfect sense and shouldn't be considered an act of ill will on Rava's part, or not intentional ill will. Such creations were, historically, nothing more than an indication that the student had mastered the Shefar Yetzirah, sort of the ultimate comprehensive examination. The process for animating a golem, and there are several, 
have been laid out in a number of sources in such seemingly straightforward language that many scholars follow the theory that there were never any physical golems at all. Instead, they postulate that the moment of understanding creation, when a man would perceive the means to create the golem, had the same weight, theologically, as actually animating a clay figure. It was enough to simply know. The people of Prague probably wouldn't have agreed with that. In the 1500s, the life of a Jew in Prague made living in 1990s Brooklyn look like a cakewalk. While Brooklyn's community undoubtedly faces accusations of usury, and worse, few people would publicly suggest that the residents of Williamsburg were killing Christian babies on a regular basis to make up some matzah for Passover, a charge that resulted in hundreds of Jews from Prague being accused of murder. The situation became so dire that in 1572, Rabbi Judah Lowe, along with his son, Rabbi Isaac HaCohen, and his student, Rabbi Yaakov Sasson HaLevi, contrived to create a physical golem of their own to protect the Jewish ghetto. Like the golem created in Kaddish, this one sprang from an interpretation of the 72 letter names of God, and went out into the community, and where Jews had once been attacked, the Gentiles of Prague began to die. How long this went on varies from account to account, but in most versions it had become pretty bloody before the Jews approached Rabbi Lowe and suggested that some other solution might be well advised. Once again, in company with his son-in-law and students, Rabbi Lowe went before the Council of Prague and put forth a number of resolutions, including laws that upheld a Jew's right to defend himself against charges laid against him, a right he didn't have at the time. That his rabbi be present during his accusation and defense, a sensible notion, as the Judaic faith made little distinction between the law-giving and the priestly functions, and that the accuser be made to prove his case. Until then, the accused was assumed to be guilty. And while life in Prague remained difficult for 16th century Jews, it improved vastly when it became illegal for them to be killed in the street. The story of Prague's golem isn't just an example of the historic oppression of the Jews. It's also instructive in its details and reveals a great deal about how golems and their creation were perceived. While the golem in Kaddish seems to have been created almost on a whim by a single person, the golem in Prague required considerable preparation. Taking the astrological and alchemical aspects of Judaic mysticism into account, Rabbi Lowe chose his assistants on the basis of their birth signs. He was born under an air constellation. His son-in-law was born under a fire sign and he chose a student who was of the water constellations to complete the trio. The golem itself, made from a suitable type of clay, was understandably considered capable of standing for the earth elements. Even with this mystic requirement satisfied, the three men didn't rush straight out to prepare their clay men. Instead, they spent a week in contemplation, fasting, and prayer to purify their minds, bodies, and souls, firmly believing that the golem, lacking any of its own aspirations, would take on those of its creators. Another part of the Prague golem story involves Rabbi Lowe's wife and her perceptions of the creature her husband brought home and introduced as a mute. The obvious inference is that, unlike other media interpretations of a golem, the X-Files might have been right on the money in depicting their golem not only as humanoid, but recognizable as a specific person. In the Prague legend, no one questioned the nature of the golem once it was properly clothed and the markings on its forehead covered. The purity of purpose comes up again when Rabbi Lowe asks that his wife not give the new member of their family any menial tasks, not even to draw water from the well for her. He is horrified to discover that his wife has set his golem to work for her, and quickly removes the creature from her house. Another version of the golem story emphasized this particular no-no by having the golem nearly drown the mistress who'd set him to work. The Sorcerer's Apprentice, a Disney film featuring Mickey Mouse as a novice mage who animates a broomstick to carry water for him, is a modern interpretation of the golem tale that still revolves around the fact that golems aren't intended for everyday tasks. If the X-Files golem acts a little contrary to more traditional versions, perhaps it's because of its unusual creation. Whatever other purposes Ariel might have had, it's obvious that her overwhelming motive was to hang on to someone she loved, the most prosaic, romantic, commonplace, and inappropriate reason possible. 
The death of the X-Files golem, however, might have come straight from the Prague tale. Both golems returned to dust high inside a synagogue at the hands of their creator. The Prague golem is rumored to lie in the same loft even now, though no one is supposed to have opened the sealed door to the room in several centuries. For those who tend to favor the more mystical, less physical version of a golem, it's interesting to note that amid the hundreds of toppled headstones in Prague's Judaic cemeteries, Rabbi Judah Lowe's is one of only a handful still standing. The synagogue said to house the golems still stands in Prague's ghetto, despite the utter destruction of almost every Jewish shrine and meeting hall under Hitler's even harsher oppression. Jews hid there in the darkest days of World War II and survived. Closer to home for Mulder and Scully was a new myth in the making in X-File 4X11011297, codename El Mundo Gira. The eyewitness report of Eladio Buente claimed, There was a noise like thunder, but very close. And then this lightning is very bright. It blinded me. I, f I fell to the ground. And then I felt the hot rain fall on me. And when I could finally open my eyes and see, I... I saw the dead goat, and then I saw Maria. She called my name once. She was lying in a puddle of yellow rain. S something had eaten at her face. Then I, I held her in my arms, and then she died. Uh, not something you'd want to tangle with on a dark night, but while Scully looks for her answers in the lab, Mulder begins to suspect the claw of El Chupacabra. Unlike its northeastern cousin, the Jersey Devil, which starred as the X-Files' indigenous North American mythical beast in the first season, or the second season's classically old-world vampire, El Chupacabra, star of El Mundo Gira, is a sort of nouveau creature. While dozens of unexplained events have been attributed to it retroactively, the new kid on the block first came to prominence in Puerto Rico as recently as the 1970s, and even there it failed to be taken seriously until it moved down from the remote hill regions and into the more populous, coastal communities where it proceeded to terrify yet more neighborhoods. Part of the problem with locating the elusive critter was the amazing variety of guises it seemed to assume at will. While the goats, cats, dogs, and even cows reputed to be its victims couldn't give a description of their attacker, El Chupacabra isn't particularly shy of human company. Yet for all the supposedly trustworthy eyewitnesses who've observed it in a variety of lighting conditions, no two ever seem to come up with matching descriptions. Mamie Touvier spotted it just outside her tiny house, squatting over the unmoving remains of her cat, she described it quite succinctly as a fox with wings, red-eyed, and with nimble hands. Enrique Torre saw a completely different sort of creature when he encountered El Chupacabra lying on a branch above his head, its tail twitching up and down to avoid touching Enrique's head as he passed below. It wasn't the critter's odd appearance that drew Torre's attention. He hadn't actually noticed the yard-long, cat-like animal with its brindled fur, long teeth, and huge webbed paws. He didn't even notice the odd hissing he later reported hearing as the thing almost purred with each breath. No, it was the unbearable stench exuded by El Chupacabra that alerted Enrique Torres to the presence lurking above him. On first catching a whiff of the rancid odor, he thought some animal had carried its prey into a tree and forgotten it. When he looked up into El Chupacabra's glowing eyes and gaping mouth, however... He realized the stench was part and parcel of the bizarre animal itself. He'd hardly gathered his wits when the smelly beast blinked twice, then disappeared into the upper branches and on into the forest. And then there are witnesses like Michael Palin, who claim El Chupacabra is as bald as your typical ex alien. Complete with bulging black eyes, enlarged heads, and tiny mouths, Palin's descriptions would warm the hearts of any ufologist. He saw two such creatures standing approximately four feet tall while inspecting his cattle on a warm summer morning, and, after overcoming his natural shock, was amazed with the speed with which they took off into the surrounding undergrowth. I was on horseback, and, uh, granted, they got a bit of jump on me, uh, but, but, I, but I couldn't have caught them if I'd been right on top of them. They didn't so much as run as, well, uh, sort of 
sort of glide in long, low hops, uh, sort of like uh, desert lizards. So, with so many witnesses reporting such apparently different creatures, how could they all possibly be lumped together as a single entity known as the Chupacabra? It seems the definitive mark of the goat sucker isn't its appearance at all, but rather what it does. Regardless of size or demeanor, all Chupacabra do the same thing, suck their victims dry, and leave the corpses, often horribly mutilated, out in plain sight. The subjects of their attacks include practically any locally available, warm-blooded and unprotected critters that happen to be handy. In one bizarre instance, a Florida woman claims to have struck an opossum while driving. Falling off to the side, she jumped from her car and hurried back along the verge to see if the animal was dead or merely injured. Before she could reach it, another creature, which fits one of the extraterrestrial-type descriptions of El Chupacabra, leapt from the low grass to the side snatched up the still wriggling body, and promptly sank its tiny teeth into the opossum's throat. El Chupacabra hissed at Ellen Varnez, and then sped back into the grass with its prize. With its spread to the American media circuit, El Chupacabra became something of an overnight sensation, and, as it migrated west, descriptions poured in. So did possible explanations. Everything from a vampire bat to feral cats to feral monkeys was considered at some point during the hunt for the mysterious creature. Other scientists, however, have a different explanation, one that revolves around people, not some cryptozoological hunt, and one that fits rather nicely into the story. Anthropologists and folklorists recognize the uniquely Latin American touches given to otherwise Western thought many years ago. Studies of the richly textured, highly symbolic, and strangely captivating version of Roman Catholicism practiced in Latin America has kept ethno-anthropologists intrigued for decades. Voodoo, as practiced in the Caribbean, is another example of a tradition capable of making connections between apparently divergent material to create a belief system perfectly suited to the needs of its practitioners. While mythologies like El Chupacabra don't quite rate up there with major religions, they do retain the essence of the regions in which they arise, and many ethnographers view the El Chupacabra legend as a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually track the birth and growth of a folktale. Of course, they don't view El Chupacabra as a real, living, blood-letting entity, but as an amalgam of the fears, hopes, and concerns of an area and its people drawn from both traditional and modern-day events. Ethnographers point out that blood-sucking monsters seem considerably less incredible in a densely populated area that is home to all three species of the world's only true vampire bats. Though El Chupacabra is today's incarnation, other bloodsuckers occur frequently in Hispanic literature and folktale, and their exclusion might well be regarded as more unusual than the inclusion of such abilities. In the region just south of the Panama Canal, legends of a man-sized bat that walked upright and fed on the blood of small children who wandered away from their families was recorded in 1794. According to Daniel Sweeney, a folklorist involved in a nine-year project to document the traditional teaching stories of the area, every culture clothes its taboos in bogeymen. Victorians told their kids that masturbation made hair grow on your palms, which at the time was also an indication of weirism, which included werewolves, weir pigs, weir everything. Blood-sucking is, for all practical purposes, a sub-form of cannibalism, one of the last remaining taboos. It would be strange not to have some sort of folklore associated with it. A high degree of symbolism surrounds most folktales, the El Chupacabra included. Ethnographers with a socio-economic slant to their work, however, take the term bloodsucker slightly more literally, pointing out that most of the vampiric-style tales evolve in countries where the native population perceives itself as victims. When a larger nation like the United States abuts and utilizes the resources of a less privileged region, it is almost inevitable that a Blood-sucking folktale will arise fairly quickly, says Peter Montreso, a Mexico City anthropologist. The facts are these. The Americans pay much less for labor in their factories here than back home. They pay less for equivalent resources, and they tend to be incredibly protectionist about civil rights within their boundaries, inversely unconcerned with what happens in the countries they see as 
satellite resource states. Now, if you track the progress of El Chupacabra stories within the United States itself, you'll see that it's a socio-economic trail that leads the goat sucker from region to region. The lower stratum of American society uh, feels the same pressures that a laborer in Colombia feels, uh, has the same monetary stress as working Hondurans, and about as much security as a Guatemalan family. These people literally feel as if their life blood, their hope, their resources are being torn away from them. The chupacabra reflects that. And how do witnesses of the chupacabra react to such highbrow commentaries? Well, shrugged Sophie Marie Torres, I suppose they need some way to rationalize it to themselves. Well, rational you may be, but it's hard to be entirely objective when the shade that haunts you seems to be the figure of death himself. That's what happens in X-File codename Elegy, in which Harold Spuller, a man who had voluntarily signed himself into a mental hospital, is suspected of the violent murders of a series of young women. Mulder suspects that the young man's involvement, though intimate, is on another level altogether. When Spuller foresees the unexpected death of his boss, a death he could have had no part in, the finger of suspicion moves on. The specter of death, whether as the European's caped figure carrying farm equipment or the slightly more welcoming tree spirits of the Nagawitha, is common to almost every human mythos. The Vikings had their Valkyries. The Tartar tribes had Vigis, a skeletal woman, riding across the plains to take the fallen heroes on to the next existence. And in general, ghost stories are probably the most persistent of human folk tales. Whether it's because, like roller coaster fanatics, we just love to be scared, or because we want to believe there's something besides an opportunity to fertilize our patch of ground after death, humanity won't give up its ghost stories. Ireland, home to the Fetch and the Banshee and hosts of other supernaturals, including a bottle imp, that sounds remarkably like Aladdin's genie, is full of stories that tie the living, the dead, the almost dead, and the very dead together. A tale out of Western Ireland could have been a template for elegy. The Garrow Gast, a fetch of a slightly different stripe, took it upon herself to warn the Darrow family whenever anyone in the area was about to die an unjust death. Why the Darrow family remains somewhat obscure, though if Irish traditions hold true, it would likely turn out that the Darrows themselves had done something unjust at one point, and the regular visitations of the Garrow Gast were a form of punishment or appeasement in themselves. In any case, it was the Garrow Gast's self-appointed task to warn the Darrows of impending disaster to one of their neighbors. The Darrows' task was to do something about it. Not doing something about it wasn't an option. If they managed to intervene in time to prevent the death, the Garrow Gast just screamed about the house for a single night, the warning night. If they ignored her and the neighbor died, she screamed the house down night after night until the next new moon. The first man rescued by the Garrow Gast and Albert Dunny was, after a profitable day in the market square, taking himself and his earnings home when he was set upon by robbers. Though his pockets were plenty heavy for the times, the robbers figured that where there was that much good coin, there was probably more at home. So instead of robbing him, coshing him on the head, and leaving him there, they lugged him off to their hiding spot and sent a note to his family asking for a ransom. Unfortunately for Albert Dunny, there was no more money at home, a fact he was all too well aware of. He might have still been dumped along a convenient road when the truth came out, if not for a piece of bad luck. The bag covering his head, not to mention half smothering him, had been loosened by the crew as the day wore on. When they attempted to shove him back in his hidey hole that night, it fell off, revealing the faces of his kidnappers. Now, money or no money, he wasn't getting loose. He knew it. The gang knew it. All that was left was to determine how and where to dispose of him. For that, the crew decided to get everyone together, something that would have looked even more suspicious at night. Instead, they'd meet in the morning. That night, the Garrow Gast made her first visit to the Darrow farm. The screaming and the sound of rock skittering across the roof of the cottage soon have everyone either out of their beds or under them. Gerald Darrow, the oldest man present, took two of his sons and some solid rake handles out around the house, but found nothing. Inside, however, his youngest boy, Harold, was pointing at the ghostly image of Albert Dunny. 
The spirit hung upright in the center of the main room, twirling about slowly, as if hung. Naturally, Harold and the rest of the family passed the message on to the others outside, who, while still inundated by the sounds of the screaming, couldn't find its source. Scared, half-witless, Harold and his brother set off to the Dunny farm to see if anything was wrong. They met his wife and two of his children on the road, all searching for Albert Dunny. With the Dunny's knowledge of the route Albert usually took, some shrewd ideas about who in the area might be up to such tricks, and a set of three good oil lanterns which quickly helped pick up the spot where the struggle took place, and the direction Albert Dunny was dragged off in, it didn't take long to find the shack the two left to guard it, and Albert Dunny tied up under a cot bed. A good brawl soon had the Dunnies and Darrows on their way home, with the two watchers dragged along for delivery to the local courts in the morning. The only piece of misfortune was that young Harold, who'd first seen the vision of Dunny twisting in the imaginary wind, caught an off-balance swing by one of Dunny's abductors. In something of a freak accident, he fell over backwards, smacked his head against the corner of a chair or table, and died. Still... Accidents happen, and farming families always seem to be at risk for one injury or another. The Dunnies went home, the Darrows mourned their dead son, and everything went back to normal. Until the next time. Nearly two years later, the same horrid screaming and the same sound of something skittering across the roof roused the Darrow household. Again, nothing could be seen outside, but the screaming didn't quiet at all until one of the Darrow boys whose name is lost to time, pointed up toward the lower eave of the cottage. The silvery apparition of Clarice Findle, a near neighbor of the Darrows, appeared to slip and fall to the ground. Not surprisingly, the Darrows hurried off to the neighboring farm to inquire after Clarice's health. Her startled parents hurried to her room only to discover she wasn't in bed at all. While they might not have been attentive, they weren't stupid and quickly guessed that young Clarice had probably snuck out to spend time with the young man she'd been sweet on for several months. Now where would they be? The nameless Darrow boy, recalling the image of the falling woman, suggested they hurry along the cliffs between the Findle farm and the farm of her young beau. Even before they could properly see anyone on the cliffs ahead, both families knew they were on the right path when they heard the solid, real-world screams of a young woman. Rounding the edge of the cliff path, they found Clarice and her bow in a heated argument. Clarice's feet dangerously near the edge of the path and her bow pushing her hard in the direction of the water. Darrow's unremembered son raced ahead, dragged the girl back onto the path, exchanged some heated comments with her suitor, and before any of the rest of the family could intervene, got into a hand-to-hand -hand fight with a man who had him on weight, height, and reach. The unsung hero of this incident may have gotten in a swing or two of his own, but if so, history doesn't record it. What is remembered is that the young Darrow boy in rescuing Clarice Findle from a suitor who didn't want her or the baby she just told him was coming, fell from the path and died two days later. It's hardly surprising, considering the way the household was being weeded away, that the Darrows tried ignoring the Garrow Gast's next house call Instead of herring off to see what might be wrong at the town smith shop, home of the next vision the Garrow Gast brought, the Darrows lit some lamps, covered their ears, and refused to budge from the house. The screaming continued all night, nearly driving Mrs. Darrow mad anyway. The sounds of rocks and feet on the roof grew even more violent. At one point, a wind blew down the chimney so hard it put out the fire in the grate. Still, the family stayed put. It was the Darrow's youngest child, Karen, who'd been first to see the visions this time, and regardless of the howling surrounding the house, a noise none of the visiting tradesmen or other neighbors seemed to hear when they came by, neither of her parents would allow the child out of the house. When news came that the blacksmith's apprentice was dead, and the blacksmith blamed for his death after smacking the boy an angry, thoughtless blow with his hammer, the Darrow's hoped for some relief. They got none until the moon changed its face once more. For thirty-four days they lived like vampires, grabbing what sleep they could during the day, and knowing they'd get none at night. Needless to say, things didn't go well for the Darrows that growing season. A dull, damp season had already made an overabundant harvest an impossibility. But with their household in chaos, and their few workers already having run off, the Darrows barely brought in enough to keep them through the winter. Karen died in February, after two weeks of fever and coughing. 
but of no specific disease that anyone could identify. Even spring brought little relief when, just as planting season was due, and the Darrows had managed to lure back a few hands to help, they were once again awakened by the yowling sound of the garrow ghast. The family's patriarch ordered his family to stay in their beds, to pull the sheets and the pillows over their heads, to squeeze their eyes together, and to keep them shut. And it just might have worked. The violent winds that seemed to accompany the garrow ghast's appearance grew stronger the longer she was ignored. And just before dawn, the inner shutter on one of the windows flew open. Mr. Darrow's eyes opened, just for a fraction of a second, just long enough to see his sister's face screaming silently in through the wind at him. Ordering his family to stay where they were, and taking no one with him, he raced across the fields to the adjoining allotment where he found her cottage in flames. Two of her older children stood outside. Their mother and father, still inside, were handing down the three youngest ones through a small door in the upper loft area. The remainder of the tale remains a bit muddled, but it seems he went inside after part of the ceiling began to fall, held the last child while his brother-in-law jumped to the ground, then helped both his sister and his nephew through before being caught under the rest of the roof. The Garrow Gast never returned to Darrow Farm, but even if she had, she'd have found no Darrows there. Within hours of learning of her husband's death, Mrs. Darrow and her remaining children and grandchildren had packed their bags and disappeared. While the tale of the Garrow Gast follows all the usual strictures for his genre, this particular story works best because of its eccentric qualities. In Ireland, no one questions the fact that it was the Darrows who were cursed. No one seems to ask why the Garrow Gast herself might use her death, the ultimate in retirement schemes, to pester a poor family of farmers. No one even questioned that she existed, though nowhere in the story does anyone see anything other than the spirits of those threatened. Despite her consistent absence from the scene, the locals who kept the story alive insisted on the ghost's existence. They even gave this faceless, formless entity a gender. They made it female. In Elegy, the spirits appeared to those about to die. So did the Garrow Ghast. But unlike the X-Files ghosts, it's difficult to determine if the Garrow Ghast herself had a hand in the deaths of the four members of the Darrow family if it was the ultimate coincidence, or if she appeared to them because they were about to die. In the X-Files, the opposite is true. We're told why the ghosts appeared to Spuller and Scully in particular, but not why they appeared in the first place. Certainly not to be saved, nor to say goodbye to someone particularly close to them, not even to point the blame to their accuser. Perhaps, like the Garrow Gast's audience, the X-Files aren't meant to know everything about the workings on the other side. Before we dig any deeper into the X-Files, it's important to know something about the special agents who risk their lives to find out what's out there, however strange and bizarre it may be. First, information from the personal file of Dana Catherine Scully, Special Agent, Department of Justice, Federal Bureau of Investigation, currently assigned to the X-Files. Dana Scully was born on February 23, 1964. She is five foot three with red hair and blue-green eyes. She is not married and has no dependents. Her older sister, Melissa, died from a single gunshot wound to the head at Agent Scully's apartment, apparently mistaken for Agent Scully by habitual criminal Louis Cardinal, now deceased. Educational Information Agent Scully came to the Bureau after taking an undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Maryland before completing a medical degree. Graduated FBI Training Academy, Quantico, in 1992. N.B. Maintained open relationship with instructor Special Agent Jack Willis during training. Work history, chronological. Completed medical residency. Assigned Quantico Training Facility, instructor. Assigned X-Files, field agent, March 6, 1992. Reassigned Quantico Training Facility, instructor. Reassigned X-Files, field agent. It is the hope of this department that Agent Scully, coming from and to all appearances more dedicated to a more traditional scientific approach, will be able to properly assess the quantitative value of Agent Mulder's work while observing that agent's general deportment and state of mind. There is Fox William Mulder, Special Agent, Department of Justice, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Agent Mulder was born on October 11, 1960. He is six feet tall with medium brown hair and hazel eyes. He is not married and has no dependents. His father is deceased, possibly murdered, and his sister, Samantha Mulder, is a registered missing person. 
It is Agent Mulder's belief that she was abducted on November 27, 1973, in unusual circumstances. Educational Information Agent Mulder graduated Oxford with a degree in psychology, graduated high in his FBI training academy, Quantico class. Work History Chronological Completed Psychology Residency Assigned Violent Crime Section, Behavioral Sciences Unit Assigned X-Files, Field Agent Assigned Intelligence Division, Communications Reassigned X-Files, Field Agent At his own request, and with the consent of his superiors, Agent Mulder has undertaken the task of investigating some previously unsolved cases. It is anticipated that this is a temporary assignment to help clear a backlog, and that Agent Mulder will soon be returning to VCS. As Agent Mulder shows no indication of returning to his previous assignment in the near future, an informal inquiry into the value of his present assignment will be instituted to determine if his skills might be better employed outside the X-Files. Agent Dana Scully has been assigned to the X-Files and will be reporting directly to the administration. Well, as regular exophiles will know, Mulder's openness to the bizarre forms of truth and Scully's medical background can make for some fascinating cases. Both were needed in X-File 4X2305-1197, codenamed Demons, in which Scully suspected that one of the more primitive medical arts had been brought into play. Trepanation, for most of us, is something we need like a hole in the head. It's not like ear or nose piercing, something teens goad one another into doing as a lark, and it certainly isn't the sort of treatment discussed daily in general practitioners' offices. While it remains a treatment of last resort for conditions like depressed skull fractures, with a few rare, not to mention colorful exceptions, trepanation, the art of jabbing a hole through your skull, is pretty much a thing of the past. Oddly, from the literature available, it seems that trepanation was first noticeable not for the hole it left in the patient's head, but for the piece of skull that used to be there. One anthropologist wrote about a series of strange decorative pieces he discovered at a variety of sites. It is difficult to avoid wondering if these tribes, like certain ones in Papua, are not headhunters, uh, disturbing as the thought may be, especially in a group we perhaps romantically considered progressive for their time, it is difficult to avoid as we continue to turn up amulets derived from what were surely human skulls, the pieces varying only slightly in size from a square of perhaps three-quarters of an inch per side, feature rough striations along each edge consistent with a number of the chipping-style implements indigenous to the region. A small hole drilled almost precisely in the center of the amulet appears to have been made to accept a string or thong. Indeed, one example discovered by Dr. Scopeland was still attached to the remains of a thong of worked leather. Uh, the amulets themselves are further decorated, uh, some with dyes, some with ash mixture rubbed into carvings which were presumably completed after removal from the victim's skull. Well, similar amulets would turn up at dig sites as distant from each other as Peru and Turkey. When trepan skulls, complete with sizable holes, were discovered in Europe, they were frequently taken to be battle injuries from an as-yet-undetermined weapon. The notion that the missing sections were trophies of one sort or another was toyed with from time to time, but in Europe, war tended to be a hack-and-slash affair, with little of the ritual common to South American or South Sea groups. That an enemy would take the time to neatly chisel his way through his victim's skull after beating him savagely just minutes before remained a contradictory but tacitly accepted idea even after the notion that Europeans had independently created the same nifty new weapon that was trepanning people half a world away was finally dropped. Soon, in-depth attention turned from the cranial chips on their length of string to the skulls themselves, and an amazingly obvious, if completely overlooked, fact turned up. A significant number of skulls proved the victims had survived the procedure. A whole new avenue of inquiry quickly opened. 
If many of those who'd undergone the trepanation procedure had not only survived it, but if the regeneration of bone was any indicator flourished after the highly invasive procedure, wasn't it possible that what had been assumed to be a war ritual was actually a medical treatment? Why else would anyone allow their neighbor to put a chisel to their heads and whack away at will? To find the answer to what conditions might have prompted early men to such drastic action, anthropologists turned to examples from modern history. Modern cutting-edge procedures of our time that might be considered equivalent included the drilling of burr holes to relieve subdural pressure, the removal of cranial sections to access interior tissue for surgical procedures, and the removal of injured sections of the cranium, i.e. depressed skull fractures, to prevent further injury to underlying tissues. Despite significant differences or assumed differences in the medical settings which accommodated patients from modern day and prehistory, the end result was remarkably similar. Still, the notion that ancient medical men were diagnosing and treating brain injuries with reasonably high rates of success, once again judging from the ratio of skulls showing bone regrowth, was hard for many academics to swallow. The research took a diametrically opposing viewpoint when anthropologists and archaeologists began literally tripping over tree-panned skulls in Peru. In total, some 10,000 skulls sporting the now familiar holes were uncovered. Even in modern times, the largest population groupings, it would be unlikely for one in every ten individuals to have had someone poke holes in their skulls for any sound medical reason. Thus was born the belief that not only physical ailment but psychological illness might well have been treated in this way. In the void of any real information about ancient psychotherapy, it was easy for tales of witch doctors releasing demons of one sort and another through holes in their patient's head to flourish. The amulets that had been considered war trophies, and which had never fit particularly well into the medical model, unless you too have an Uncle Ernie who likes to display his gallstone on the fireplace mantle, became symbolic of the so-called spirits and evil humors that trepanation came to be associated with. In a sort of reverse history lesson, a whole model of myths, legends, and medical treatments was created for the Mesoamericans, based more on the romanticism mentioned by that earlier anthropologist than on any tangible physical evidence from the skulls, the cranial pieces, or the sites where they were found. In 1962, a Peruvian doctor, using precisely the tools identified as prehistorical trepanning instruments, took drastic measures to intervene in a drastic situation involving a patient with severe head trauma. The tools were easily as effective as those in current medical use, and the patient, who survived and was released just days later, had every reason to agree. That incident turned the attention of many in the field back to a medical survey of those skulls down in Peru. Now this time, a fairly detailed catalog was made of a thousand of them, a good representative sample. Several factors came to light. One researcher, personally responsible for the cataloging of 450 skulls, determined that some 280 patients had recovered and lived an average of 8 to 12 years after the surgery. With an expected lifespan of just over 30, that's not bad. A second researcher, working at a different site, where there were a number of bodies associated with the skulls, began a holistic study of the bodies, not just the heads. Though she was working with a smaller selection of skulls, a certain pattern of injuries, other than the obvious hole in the head, started to become apparent. A pattern similar to that found in modern-day epileptics. Just as there is a modern-day pattern of increased incidences of epilepsy in portions of the Chinese population, in comparison with worldwide figures, modern citizens of Peru also suffer from that particular disease in higher than average numbers. In fact, that correlation is one of the many items that indicate the land-bridge theory between Siberia and Alaska may well account for human beings living in the Americas at all. If prehistorical Peruvians, a large but tightly knit population, reflected a similar set of statistics, then the possibility of medical trepanning on a wide scale begins to make sense once again. Modern epilepsy treatment relies heavily on drug therapies, but at one point a surgical procedure which separated the hemisphere of the brain was one treatment being heavily studied and endorsed by the medical profession. Separating the hemispheres of the brain for some patients provided instant relief. Of course, that's 
still a pretty drastic form of treatment with a host of unwanted side effects, and in keeping with the less invasive philosophy being widely supported in all health fields, drug therapies became better investigated and more effective, making dangerous surgeries less and less common. In early Peruvian society, however, two things could have contributed to a long-term preference for the surgical option. First of all, unlike many European societies, Peru was home to several anesthetic-producing plants. These plants, which even without fancy laboratories, gave up not only local-type anesthetics but distillations capable of rendering people unconscious in a reliable way, made the trepanation operation considerably less horrendous for an early Peruvian than his European cousin. The fact that the other locales where trepanned skulls were located in large numbers, like Turkey and Southeast Asia, all produced plants with similar properties, suggests that the available pharmacopoeia might well have contributed to the number of patients willing to undergo surgery. The second reason is also plant-related. Although Peru had vast resources of anesthetics, it had few of the plants which would become common in the treatment of falling sickness elsewhere. Mongolia, with its relatively high incidence of epilepsy, produced no fewer than ten plants which were believed to be beneficial in its treatment. Chinese physicians had dozens of recipes based on the local flora. Peru had none. Neither did Turkey, Mexico, or the South Sea Islands, where trepanned skulls regularly turn up. The epilepsy-trepanation connection, while intriguing from an anthropological and medical point of view, remains to be conclusively proven, however, and in the absence of such definitive proof, the colorful, often haunting tales of demons being released from the heads of possessed individuals are certainly likely to stick in the average person's romantic mind. It's romanticism of another sort altogether that brought trepanation back into general public awareness during the 1960s and 1970s. According to subculture lore, trepanning has another wholly unmedical facet, waiting for those brave enough to visit their local home improvement shop and pick up a common drill with a bit of oomph to its motor. If the news item that popped up in Denmark and Great Britain during that time are to be believed, at least half a dozen individuals, either jointly or as soloists, decided to give do-it-yourself trepanning a try. Some cases, like that of Amelia Martin, who suffered from a variety of mental illnesses which convinced her something very close to the demons attributed to the Mesoamericans lived in her brain and were telling her to do terrible things, could be written off as mental aberrations. But some of these home surgeries were performed by people who the medical profession would call perfectly sane. While the rest of their generation sought peace, love, and sexual freedom, helping it along with a hefty dose of mind-altering chemicals, a small nook in the peace, love, rock-and-roll world was looking for its own version of nirvana, the permanent, perfect high. Sometime during that period, the brain-blood-volume theory gained limited fame. It postulated that when human beings took to walking upright, they lost some of their brain's blood flow. In children whose skull sutures the joints in the cranium, have yet to completely fuse, the volume of blood reaching the brain is thought to be high. Adults with their fixed bones are believed by some to suffer from a further blood volume loss. To those seeking to regain the innocence, the enthusiasm, the seemingly unlimited learning potential, and the uninhibited outlook of a child, the answer seemed impossibly easy. Just open up those sutures. Now, the only problem is, of course, that removing the calcium and bone cells that form between the plates making up the cranium is completely impossible. Undaunted, a very few seekers of renewed childhood reportedly decided to create their own soft spot by reviving the ancient art of trepanation. The survivors became sort of retrograde icons who even set up their own traveling tent shows, preaching the wonders of trepanation. Lots of people seem to have listened, but the actual number of disciples were, perhaps, not surprisingly, few. Body piercing, tattooing, even branding have all remained as symbols of both rebellion and individuality, but it's doubtful that Black & Decker stock is about to surge on the basis of the revival of DIY trepanation. 
But if trepanation isn't high on the public health agenda, drug abuse is, and a worrying number of publicly available drugs can have serious and unwanted consequences if they get into the wrong hands. An X-File 4X20042097, code name Small Potatoes. Five children are born in Martinsburg, West Virginia. They have the usual ten fingers and the usual ten toes. But they also have something most unusual, a tail. As Mulder and Scully's investigations quickly reveal, they also have one more thing in common. Their father. When all five women claim never to have laid eyes on Eddie Van Blunt, the father of their children, Mulder's wondering if Eddie isn't the latest in their list of shape-shifting mutants. Scully, more practically, is thinking Rohypnol. Any doctor worth a damn, if confronted with a pregnant woman who swore to have absolutely no memory of conception, would without doubt think Rohypnol instead of Immaculate Conception. To date, only one case of Immaculate Conception remains under serious scrutiny, while at least six cases of Rohypnol rape, including two encounters that resulted in pregnancy, are currently before various American courts. One, given considerable airtime just six to eight months before Small Potatoes was aired, brought the date-rape drug onto the talk show discussion list and into common parlance in many American communities. Rohypnol, a brand name for the group of drugs called Flunitrazepam, is one of a new generation of drugs, highly engineered drugs, that's quickly becoming a darling among users and the romantically challenged. With its own litany of street names, everything from Rufies to Roach with Forget Me Yes, R2, Rope, La Roach, and, of course, Rape, Rohypnol is the dream drug for any number of habitual users. Pop a single Rohypnol at less than $5 U.S. with a single beer and enjoy that pleasantly poached feeling for as much as eight hours. Makes getting drunk almost affordable again. If cocaine is your drug of choice, Rohypnol takes care of the after-using crash. In fact, it so softens the landing that some people claim they just stay a little above normal for hours. But Rohypnol is a flexible drug. Not only does it make the downs easier, it intensifies the highs. Some of the most sought-after combo packs for users right now include heroin with the Rohypnol. It cranks up the high, smooths out the crash, and... It's legal. It is legally produced and sold in 60 countries and, at this time of writing, could be brought back into the United States, where most Rohypnol abuse seems concentrated in any quantity, as long as the person bringing it back had a prescription. It's driving drug enforcement personnel crazy, says one officer. We watched hundreds of units come up from Tijuana in just one afternoon. The prescriptions these kids were carrying were photocopies. The doctor down there just had a bunch printed up to save the strain on his wrist, and he's perfectly within his rights to do so. There's nothing we can do to stop it coming in. Just, just watch kids get into deeper trouble when it hits the streets. Drug abuse, while still a serious problem in literally thousands of American neighborhoods, is unfortunately slow news when the media is looking for a fresh headline. The war on drugs, having fulfilled its political purpose, has been very much on the back burner. The teens aren't listening either. They live with guns in school locker rooms, drive-by shootings, and the risk of AIDS every time they make out. Something that punches up a high or makes a beer go further just isn't going to frighten them off. It was Rohypnol and Champagne that sent rock star Kurt Cobain into a coma state in Rome just before his eventual suicide. Everyone knows the coma was alcohol involved. Everyone knows he'd been in and out of rehab. Everyone knows he died long before he might have. But how many people realize it was Rohypnol that completely eradicated his drinking judgment? No, what caught media attention was the forget pill and date-rape drug titles that began to appear with increasing frequency as women and girls around the United States reported being raped while incapacitated by the drug. At first, even some officials failed to recognize the danger inherent in Rohypnol. Some even claimed it was nothing more than a, a way for a good girl to have a good time and not catch hell from home. Well, nothing was further from the truth. The breakdown of inhibitions which drinkers noticed as they increased the amount of Rohypnol they took with alcohol was nothing compared to the complete and almost instant amnesia suffered by those taking even slightly higher dosages. 
Something else that abusers of the rohypnol-alcohol combination quickly discovered? The drug is completely tasteless and completely odorless when mixed with alcohol. Two tablets, enough to render a fully grown woman practically unconscious in less than ten minutes, dissolves in less than a second, less than the time it takes to look around for a friend, less than the time it takes to glance away and light a cigarette. A frightening scenario was suddenly being acted out across the southern United States. Girl and female friend go to bar for a drink. Girl asks friend to watch her drink while she goes to powder her nose. Friend is distracted by one of a pair of young men, asking if she dropped this compact wallet, scarf, whatever. Other half of the pair drops the tablets. Within half an hour, two sober, upright-appearing young men are helping their drunk dates home. Who would interfere? No one. And that's the complex version. Even simpler to spend some time smiling from the other end of the bar, order a drink for the lady, and, in the process of walking down the bar, drop the tablets and hand them over. Any glass left unattended for a single second was a potential danger a trap that some victims might never realize had been sprung. The drug in those concentrations has an entirely predictable course of effect. A slight sense of dizziness could be caused by anything, the drink itself, stooping to get a purse, or even skipping lunch. In short, nothing frightening. The growing disorientation is too similar to drunkenness to arouse anyone's attention. The simultaneous chills and sweats the victim suffers next are psychological, not physical. No one watching the process would realize the distinct mental displacement behind something as innocent as a shiver. And nausea? Well, how many people have been to a bar regularly and not seen someone get sick? That nausea is usually the attacker's cue to get in there, quickly. Less than fifteen minutes after ingesting the drug, as little as two minutes after beginning to feel a little queasy, the victim may no longer be able to call for help. Enunciation is severely impaired in rohypnol poisoning, and is swiftly followed by difficulty moving and, finally, unconsciousness. The amnesia experienced by victims is as real as that suffered by any patient under a general anesthesia. Ask Aunt Matilda just how much she remembers about her appendectomy, and you've got some notion of just how little these victims recall. It's the amnesia that creates real difficulties, not only for the unfortunate victim, but for the law enforcement personnel trying to prosecute the case. In any criminal proceeding, the victim must give some evidence of a crime having occurred. Well, in most cases, eyewitness testimony is considered a baseline necessity. Victims of rohypnol may have no direct memory or proof that they were raped. Unconscious victims seldom fight back, so there are normally no defensive injuries. Unconscious victims also typically lack the vaginal bruising and tearing normally associated with a rape, unless the victim realizes what may have happened during her blackout and immediately seeks the assistance of someone with a rape kit available. The embarrassed woman is just as likely to shower away whatever evidence would have supported her claim. As more cases hit both the courts and the news, however, some changes are being made. Use of rohypnol in a date-rape situation is now a felony under American law, and with felonies carrying sentences of up to twenty years, not to mention fines of a quarter of a million dollars, it's possible that some few frat boys will have second thoughts. The real answer, of course, as always, is education, but that might come slowly. Rohypnol is currently still on the easy import section of the customs list. Testing for rohypnol remains expensive, and few law enforcement jurisdictions outside of Florida and Texas seem inclined to test for its use, even in situations where alcohol levels alone can't account for dangerous driving. While several flyers have been sent out across the country supposedly alerting police to the possibility of rohypnol in their area, a survey by the College Women's Association revealed that less than 8% of officers participating in the survey realized the date-rape drug was rohypnol. If supposedly on-the-ball officials in law enforcement and customs stations haven't grasped the problem, how can the information trickle down to women who just want a drink after work? Clarice S., who was taking a former acquaintance back to court following his conviction on rohypno-involved rape, has a little more at stake than even the other victims whose cases are pending. In May of 1997, nine months after her rape, 
Miss S. delivered an eight-pound baby boy in desperate and immediate need of specialized medical care and organ transfer tissue. I had no idea who'd done this to me. I knew that before Joshua was born there weren't any possible donors in my family, and without a dedicated police investigation and some sympathetic prosecutors, I'd have no idea where to look next. Luckily, his paternal uncle appears to be a match, and we can hope. But even two years ago, my case, the case that proved who Joshua's father was, would have been thrown out for lack of evidence. In X-File 4X140126970, codename Leonard Betts, Mulder is all set to track down his own version of the Headless Horseman when a decapitated body just disappears from the morgue of a local hospital. Scully isn't buying any of it, and on discovering the missing head in an industrial-sized waste management unit, promptly suggests a far more likely candidate, body snatchers. The strange but true section of the X-Files gets bigger every day, and if you were to read some of the weirdest files alongside some of the tabloid newspapers, you'd be hard put to tell them apart. Tabloid tales of corpses rising from the dead are a case in point, and with that image in mind, articles like these, taken to the next degree, could all be X-Files. From Melbourne, Australia, a 47-year-old man racing naked down the street is promptly arrested for public indecency. The judge, however, declared the man was entirely justified in his actions when it was revealed that he'd just awoken in a mortuary where the local physician-mortician had, moments before, declared him dead. A 92-year-old man in Paza, Brazil, refused to have his wife buried within the four days recommended by the sanitation statutes. His reason? Consuela Rodriguez had already woken up from three fatal heart attacks and a diabetic coma. In all four instances, she'd been declared dead by qualified doctors. Paolo's faith in his wife was justified once again when on the fifth day after her death, Consuela groaned once, coughed twice, opened her eyes, and sat up in her coffin. Her comment? Oh, this box is nice, Papa. So much better than the last one. Nor is Scully the first doctor to be startled by a dead patient suddenly moving or blinking. Colin Blackmore, an undertaker from Campbellton, nearly had heart failure when Minnie McDermott, brought in dead from a local hospital, sat up and smacked me right across the face, as Blackmore was washing down the body. Ms. McDermott, who had a history of heart disease, had been dead twenty-three hours before Blackmore gave her the post-mortem shower that roused her. She demanded I hand her a sheet off one of the other bodies, went to the phone, called her son, chewed him out royally, and then gave him directions to a blue suit she felt would be more appropriate than my sheet for the ride home. Well, needless to say, Blackmore's a little less relaxed around his cadavers than he used to be. Uh, gives a man a fair turn when a thing like that happens. In Ms. McDermott's case, no autopsy had been performed or was even planned. She was 83 years old with a well-documented history of heart failure and had died in hospital while under a physician's care. As it was highly unlikely that she was a victim of foul play, there was really no reason to perform a post-mortem exam. Well, that wasn't the situation in the case of Asuncion Hadley. Miss Hadley's death at a vigorous 23, with no one except a boyfriend with a history of domestic violence in attendance, was considered more than a little suspect. The coroner, scheduled to complete the autopsy, quickly developed suspicions of his own. Like the fictional Leonard Betts, Asuncion showed none of the usual signs of death. There was no pooling of blood, no stiffness, no discoloration. The only mark on her entire body was a bruise under her hair, just above the nape of her neck. Asuncion Hadley looked as beautiful ten hours after she died as she ever had. Victor Engel, the coroner, even asked that the time of death be checked again. It just didn't seem to match the body before him. When he laid one hand alongside her throat to start the long Y incision that would begin the internal portion of the examination, Engel felt his own heart lurch. Under his thumb was a faint but distinct pulse. I remember cutting my thumb on the scalpel. I recall calling for one of the techs. I even remember calling 911. Engel still shakes his head at the memory. Then she just opened her eyes 
I, I don't quite recall how it happened, but, well, by the time the EMT showed, she was sitting out in my office, and I was getting her some coffee. She, she kept saying how cold she was. Well, I guess she was. Looking back, the experience is just as disjoint from Asuncio and Hadley's point of view. The last thing I remember was arguing with my boyfriend. I yelled. He got mad. He smacked me, and I tumbled back, tripped, and hit my head on something. The next thing I recall is, is this sweet old man wrapping me up in his coat and feeding me coffee. I stank of disinfectant. Forty in Times, a magazine to which several of the X-Files crews are long-time subscribers, reported an equally startling event halfway around the world in southern Taiwan. Mr. Chen Chun Nan, who'd apparently died in a car crash in late April 1996, had been laid out at a funeral home where his heartbroken wife was crying over his body. In between bouts of tears, she wiped her eyes, looked over at her husband, and watched as he did a very uncorpse like thing. He sweat. Well, needless to say, the funeral plan for the following morning was postponed indefinitely. For all those miracles, however, there wasn't one for Hai Sin Chin Lo, who, to all appearances, had been a devoted wife for nearly thirty years. Her one flaw, according to the husband who cut off her head, was that she had bad breath. It was the bad breath that had prompted the impromptu after-dinner decapitation. It seems Mr. Chin, a practicing acupuncturist and herbal physician, had considerable belief in the chi and his power to manipulate it. When police arrived at his home, he was leaning over his headless wife, exhorting her to grow a new head. Mulder and Scully face up to one of their more unpleasant truths in X-File 4X1502-0997, codename Memento Mori. When a standard medical examination confirms that Scully has developed a cancerous mass, Mulder's refusal to accept the inevitable his insistence on tracing the fates of the women Scully met after her abduction, women who, like Scully, are dying of brain tumors, prods her back into action. What she finds, however, seems destined to take her in another direction altogether, a direction diametrically opposed to Mulder's investigations. Memento Mori, literally, remember thy death, seemed all too pertinent advice for Scully in this case if only for the hope it should have inspired. Though the death rites and customs from the times when memento mori were commonplace might seem morbid, bizarre, even macabre to us now, they were meant as much as affirmations of life as they were death tokens, and reflected the changing styles of death within a community. Their appearance in the Middle Ages may be related to the Christianity's sudden fascination with the relics of saints and martyrs, but quickly took on highly individual themes, and by the Victorian era had progressed well beyond the habit of keeping a locket of hair. No longer were bodies buried somewhere convenient on the family property without so much as a headstone. Deaths, deathbed scenes, and the interment of bodies became highly ritualized events that proscribed the actions of families and communities for considerable stretches of time. The most familiar of the many types of memento mori have, since the medieval era, been items of visual art, and, like so many things meant to be symbolic, often appear to hold meanings that modern sensibilities would find completely contradictory to their original intent. How could a death's head, the decoration of a grave marker, become a popular design for a lady's ring? What possible purpose would be served by propping up the recently deceased for a formal photograph? What comfort could reasonably be derived from expending several months' wages to have your dead relative's funerary flowers committed to canvas, or to building a mausoleum infinitely more expensive than your home? In one sense, all these seemingly bizarre activities were the ultimate in denial, yet at their heart they were also steps in the process of acceptance, and an ongoing proof that death could be prescribed that death was still marginally within human control, and that there was indeed a difference between a good death and the haphazard, or even accidental death. Though few of the outward symbols associated with memento mori, no death's heads, no roses held upside down, no morning glories or weeping willows intruded on the scenes, 
many of the forms and philosophy of the period were present. For most people, death comes in bed, and in the early 19th century, for example, it wasn't unusual to confine the ill or infirm to their beds to help them avoid an unseemly end. It's been suggested, with rather strong supporting evidence, that it was the possibility of death inherent in childbirth throughout the medieval to Victorian eras that resulted in the woman's confinement to a bed, instead of being up and walking about, both of which would have made her considerably more comfortable. It may also have satisfied an unstated human impulse to link the beginning of a life with its end. Throughout this episode, theories of birth and death are twisted tightly together. The password to a computer list of the dead and dying is hidden in an Easter ornament, itself an example of the life-death rebirth cycle. The woman's deadly cancer is tied to fertility drugs and treatments. As Scully seems prepared to accept her death, Mulder discovers her ova at a facility where the natural order of life is being altered. And through it all, Scully spends most of her time in bed. The deathbed scene was once circumscribed as a wedding ceremony, a full-fledged public ceremony throughout the 12th to 15th centuries. A more private family occasion up to the end of the Victorian era, the deathbed scene wasn't just a weeping frenzy. It had purpose to put one's life in order. Those who'd been confined to their beds early had plenty of time to think, to pray, to visit with family, to repair old friendships, to end lingering arguments, and to evaluate their lives. For those participating, it was something of an honor to attend a deathbed, as it reiterated the importance and esteem in which you were held. The dying gave considerable thought to who they wished to see, and what they would say to them. Advice, guidance expressions of love, even discussions on philosophy and religion weren't uncommon topics of conversation. In the episode Memento Mori, Scully's diary fulfills a very similar function for her as it did, in fact, in Dodd Calm. In it, she details her advice, her hopes, and her fears about life, as well as death. Her visits with and from Penny Northern play out the deathbed scene yet again. And again, it isn't death that's emphasized, but an evaluation of life. While Scully's confinement isn't as ritualized as those of earlier generations, which were so occupied with ensuring that everything should have been done, was done, that they created whole books on the etiquette of death, the Ars Moriendi, it evidently fulfilled a need. It was while she was surrounded by death, as out of control and powerless as she's ever been in her own memory not out chasing down clones and ice-pick-wielding assassins, that she determined there were things she hadn't finished, things she wanted to follow through. Though the Victorians might not have approved of her decision, you weren't supposed to get off a deathbed after all, they'd have approved of the process. And in the ex filian universe, the search is as important as the goal. The inability to attend at a deathbed, a tragedy by medieval or Victorian standards, is reflected in this episode as well. Though Scully couldn't call herself Penny's friend, and even denied any memory of a prior relationship, she remained with the other woman until her death, at a time when Scully herself could probably have benefited considerably from undisturbed rest. Perhaps, as her diary entries reflect, she was seeking what others have hoped to find in the deathbed scene, a glimpse into the hereafter, some indication of what her own path would be. It wasn't uncommon for a person's dying words to be captured and remembered by those present, and for transcriptions of the event to be circulated among those unlucky enough not to be in attendance at the time. Even Mulder, though convinced of the importance of his searches elsewhere, returns to her side, to her apparent deathbed, instead of continuing to track his paranormal and pseudo-military sources. It's not only in these deathbed scenarios that Memento Mori holds true to much earlier death customs. Scully's situation, while rather unique for the present day, has many facets in common with more archaic times. We never learn what steps Mrs. Mulder might have taken if Fox hadn't risen from the dead on the third day. But Scully's first apparent death, after her abduction by Duane Barry, was played out to the last detail, including the erection of a headstone for her. 
Even those who prearrange their own real-life funerals today haven't quite the intimate knowledge that the fictional Scully does of what her death will mean to those around her. While we may have abandoned many of the philosophical and religious discussions common to previous centuries, the maxim to remember thy death continues to evoke many levels of meaning. Such contemplations would certainly appeal to Mulder, who remains convinced that her first death and this impending crisis are linked in a cause-effect relationship, that her first death wasn't nearly as fatal as even her mother would have believed, might provide Dana Scully with faith in herself and in the partner who refused to concede her death the first time around, the first person with whom she now chooses to share her illness. The X-Files has been exploring death of various sorts for four years. The first act that Mulder and Scully take on together is the disinterment of a body. Scully's continuous exposure to the technical side of autopsy instead of just the written reports most agents deal with is further explored in Irresistible. The mortality rate among the friends and relatives of both Mulder and Scully has become almost humorous for its frequency, but in the process has certainly driven home the mortality of the leads. Mulder held his dying father. Scully buried the sister mistaken for her. Indeed, few episodes haven't included the birth-death-rebirth theme. Mulder rose from the grave of his boxcar. Jeremiah Smith literally brought the dead back to life. Mulder's mother from the brink of death. From the first season, when Samuel's touch returned life to the dead and Deep Throat died under Scully's hand, the two have found despair and hope equally surrounded by hope. That both leads have been declared dead already, both separately in Beyond the Sea and Anazazi, and together in Dodkalm, only to survive despite the odds, is in itself a source of hope. Memento Mori, in satisfying the expectations of the period from which the phrase came, also satisfy the needs of its modern viewers. An argument can even be made that the smaller details, the Memento Mori themselves, are evolving within this fictional world. Instead of weeping willows, we have snow globes. Instead of deathbed confessions, we have diaries. The medieval mind would have approved. Some of the X-Files medical research looks like it comes from the wilder shores of medical fact, but the files of a number of American hospitals in the 1990s contain cases much nearer to home. Maybe the older generation isn't so far off the mark when they say that hospitals are among the most dangerous places in the world to spend any time. If there's any truth at all to X-File 4X06111096, codename Sanguinarium, they're right. An amazing 83% of all Americans have been hospitalized at some point in their lives, most for invasive surgery of some type or other, and worldwide figures indicate that residents of Great Britain, China, India, and Japan are twice as likely to spend three or more days in a hospital than their parents were. We aren't necessarily any sicker, but it seems we're willing to undergo some pretty drastic procedures almost at the drop of a hat. Even after excluding all plastic and aesthetic surgeries, we're still ten times as likely to end up under the knife than our grandparents. It seems that, as modern surgical procedures come to be perceived as safer and more reliable, we're more willing to take risks with ourselves. In 1991, researchers at Harvard concluded that some 86,000 Americans die every year from negligence in American hospitals. 
Hundreds of thousands are maimed, injured, or infected with further diseases. It's a rather sobering thought for most people when we realize that American hospitals are generally considered to be some of the best health care facilities in the world. The chilling reality is that stupid errors happen every day, and almost anyone working in a hospital is a source of risk to the patient. In South Africa, staff were beginning to think they had some malign presence lurking in the corner of one ward. Regardless of the condition of patients assigned to one of the ward's intensive care beds, no one ever seemed to leave it alive. The fact that the deaths occurred with clock-like regularity every Friday morning only encourage the wild speculation working its way through the entire facility. Though the answer turned out to be all too prosaic, a member of the janitorial staff had simply been unplugging respirator plugs to accommodate her noisy floor cleaner, it also proved how precarious our hold of life can be once we allow ourselves to become vulnerable through treatments or surgeries. Nor is simple, if tragic, human error the only cause for alarm. Patients looking into joint replacements have their own special concerns. Nowhere in the world are there currently regulations which prohibit the reuse of salvaged mechanical joints. Imagine Carol Meyer's surprise when, just two months after a hip replacement, after she found herself right back in hospital with overwhelming pain, she discovered the model she'd been given already had racked up considerable mileage in two other people. Neither the raging bone infection spreading through her pelvis nor the agony of having the faulty equipment removed would have been necessary if she'd received the brand-new, out-of-the-box hip she'd been led to believe would be used. Medical truths stranger and more bizarre than these lie deep in the heart of the X-Files. But for the alert student of history, too, these secret files contain deafening echoes of the past. In X-File 4X0911-2496, codenamed Tunguska, Mulder decides to backtrack the trail of a diplomatic pouch containing a rock with some rather unusual properties. Meanwhile, Scully is left holding a different sort of bag in front of a Senate investigating committee. Her position, along with Assistant Director Skinner's, gets increasingly uncomfortable as it becomes obvious that Mulder prefers roaming around the Russian countryside to accepting his own Senate invitation. The background to this file is a well-documented event from the early years of the 20th century. On June 30, 1908, seismic shockwaves set the needles of earthquake recorders dancing all over Russia and jostled instruments as far away as the American capital of Washington, D.C., Closer to the source, a swampy area between the lower, upper, and stony Tungus rivers, naked eye watchers stared upward at the mushroom cloud, blacking out the sun all that day. And that, for the next several nights, reflected so much of the setting sun's light that Siberians two hundred miles away could read their papers without any need for lamps. The black rain that fell for the next week kept people eyeing the sky warily even after the odd glow faded. Even closer, Tungus tribesmen, some of whom claimed to see a streak of light flash across the sky earlier that night, were knocked from their feet by the hot shock waves. Anyone closer than that simply didn't survive the blast that burnt acres of forest, snapped two-foot-thick trees like matchsticks, and flattened a further eight hundred square miles of tough coniferous forests. It would be some twenty years, however, before a Russian scientist, Leonid Kulik, came, saw, and was overawed by the devastation. Trees laid out in rows neat enough to be the envy of any honor guard marched across the hillsides for as far as the eye could see. In less than five minutes, a blast with a force some estimate as equal to a thousand of the bombs dropped on Hiroshima had utterly leveled an area larger than London and New York City combined and no one really knew why. Before Kulik arrived on the scene, a volcanic explosion was thought to be the culprit. After all, the Krakatoa eruption, a comparatively recent event happening only twenty-five years earlier in 1883, had thrown dust over thirty miles in the air, debris that would fall again over a ten-day period as much as three thousand miles away. The Krakatoa blast was clearly heard as far as twenty-five hundred miles away, and the glow from its dust cloud lasted even longer than that of the Tunguska event. The theory quickly lost favor when no cone or evidence of volcanic ash and debris could be found in the relatively flat, swampy region. 
and although Tunguska isn't a bustling metropolis, the area was lightly inhabited, and there were no witnesses to any of the aftershocks that normally follow even the less massive quakes. Kulik, however, was a geologist with an interest in meteorites, not volcanoes, and he'd been collecting fragments at impact sites for some years before he finally made it to Tunguska. Far from being disappointed to shelve the volcano theory, he spent the next fourteen years actively searching for evidence that might support a meteorite or comet impact explanation for Tunguska. Including the first expedition in 1927, Kulik led five separate expeditions to the remote region. Considering the technology available to him at the time, the inhospitable terrain and the short, warmer season during which scientists could work, Kulik's documentation of the scene was incredible. He photographed the area, perhaps recognizing that the natural process of reforestation would certainly hide the site from later colleagues, and provided the first record of the extent of damage and the first rough maps. He dragged the murky swamps for evidence of fragments, a task made even more daunting by the clouds of mosquitoes that could drive a man half crazy. He collected the contradictory eyewitness testimony of locals, keeping accurate records without attempting to make their statements fit his own theories, something that would happen in later situations when other investigators arrived. The Second World War influenced the Tunguska inquiries in two completely unrelated ways. As images of the explosions over Japan were flashed around the world, some few scientists quickly associated the mushroom clouds with the similar formations reported over Tunguska. The only problem with even the early expressions of a connection between the man-made explosions and the Tunguska event was that in 1908 no such technology existed. Perhaps at a time when paranoia was running high, science fiction literature and film were popular, and there were still no explanations for Tunguska, the notion that some other agency, something not terrestrial, crash-landed into Tunguska might catch the popular imagination. Sometime after the Second World War, local legends of the Tungus tribesmen whose shamans tied themselves to the ground in order to avoid being taken by sky people during the trance period, when the spirits communed with the spirits of the sky, surfaced. These stories, much more symbolic than real to the Tungus themselves, were quickly whipped into alien abduction scenarios that even Mulder would consider beyond the limits of extreme possibility. Before long, the craft that might have crashed or exploded in Tunguska became alien spacecraft, and government cover-ups and military intelligence were held responsible for the absence of evidence. The more extravagant explanations, that Tunguska was the Russian version of Area 51, that even the Siberians mightn't be aware of a well-concealed base of alien operations, or that the aliens were already establishing a permanent underground society, and that they'd chosen Tunguska because its isolation would provide them with plenty of time to become a force on their new home world did, with satisfying speed to serious researchers, fade out. What was left, however, was the idea that as there was no evidence to support even the least fantastic theory, or that of a meteor or asteroid impact, it might be time to open up the field of inquiry to other areas. It was about this time that the black hole and antimatter theories came into vogue. In both cases, theorists speculated that some cosmic anomaly with virtually no size had struck and, in effect, passed through the planet. Well, these theories didn't account for the streak of light that was reported earlier, but did have the advantage of explaining the total lack of physical evidence at the site. And, as no one had ever observed or really even speculated about the consequences of such impacts, there were few well-developed reasons why some unknown space particle or a tiny gravitational quirk couldn't be responsible. Still, the promoters of such theories were in the minority. There had been a streak of light reported by dozens of independent observers, even if they couldn't seem to agree on the direction or altitude of the object making the display. That streak and the deafening boom that accompanied it all seemed to point to a considerably more solid culprit. To determine the angle, and probably strike location, other scientists would meticulously map the area again, enlarging and expanding Kulik's early efforts by adding notations on the direction of tree fall, the degree and depth of accompanying burns, 
and chronicling the still-standing trees at the supposed epicenter of the blast. Kulik himself couldn't be part of these refinements. World War II's second effect on the Tunguska event investigations had been the loss of the enthusiastic scientist who died in a prisoner of war camp, far from the great mystery. The next pieces of the puzzle will come from outside the region, from scientists who, like those who longed to explore nearby Lake Baikal, had, for political reasons, remained barred from the sensitive military region. There was Manati Gali, who thought it was about time someone checked for the heavy isotopes and radiation so frequently associated with cosmic intruders. Even if, as was now speculated, the meteor had been essentially vaporized higher in the atmosphere, some particle, some energetic residue, had to have been produced. After almost ninety years, however, it wasn't going to be easy to find. Repeated draggings of the deep swamps had already proven that there were simply no larger fragments to analyze. As in the beginning, the trees were the only evidence that anything had happened in Siberia, and Galley made them the focus of his investigations. All trees produce various amounts of resin, the same substance which played such a pivotal role in Michael Crichton's tales of re-engineered dinosaur DNA. Trees also provided a rough chronology of the area in which they'd grown. A tree that survived the original blast might well have been peppered with the most minute particles from the exploding meteor, particles that would be in rings of approximately ninety years' age. In partnership with a colleague named Giuseppe Longo, Galli began a physical and chemical examination of tree samples. Early results looked positive, but one chunk of wood, which was all they had, was hardly representative of the overall region, or the soil, water, and air samples that provide baselines against which further results could be gauged. In their turn, they too would discover how miserable a Siberian swamp is when its flying insects, frantic for the blood meals necessary for reproduction, discover a couple of healthy Italian men in their midst. Having given up what was becoming known as Tunguska's blood sacrifice, however, they returned home with more samples. Months later, as they identified oddly shaped particles with the assistance of high-powered microscopes that Kulik would likely have drooled over, it became clear that they'd found what everyone was looking for, the physical result of an explosion at an altitude which would explain the lack of a central crater. The only real remaining question is just how did a sizable chunk of space rock end up as a mass of grain so tiny that more than a thousand of them, laid side by side, would barely make a line an inch long. Frankly, even with the gigantic technological leaps that have taken place since native Siberians looked up to see a light flash across the early morning sky, that's something of a mystery. Computer models suggest that an object entering the atmosphere from a steep angle may well deform sufficiently to create heat, even more intense than previously suspected, converting hydrogen creating, in effect, a naturally occurring hydrogen bomb. Other models, however, equally well supported by current concepts of high-speed impacts, produce the classic impact crater and ripple effect zone that allowed other researchers to discover the Yucatan crash site that may have killed off the dinosaurs, all of which leaves the lay audience with considerably more practical and pointed questions. What would have happened had the Tunguska event exploded over Rome, or London, or Washington? First of all, would there have been any warning? Can modern astronomy find such small but potentially deadly rocks out against the vast canopy of space? The asteroid, which recently burrowed its way into Jupiter, was likely hundreds of times as large as whatever exploded over Tunguska. The Yucatan crash was a mere speck compared to Shoemaker Levy. So, how much warning? would we realistically have? Even if we had warning, would it really do any good? How do you outrun an event with the potential to affect entire continents? Luckily, even events in areas as remote as Tunguska get noticed. From the lack of similar reports through recorded human history, and by working in the statistics on population density, the percentage of the planet covered by water, it's statistically unlikely that any asteroids will be slamming into a major city any time soon, and dedicated people are searching for anything threatening, even as this article is written. Neat.
the Near-Earth Asteroid Tracking Project, has identified seven Earth crossers, including one nearly three kilometers across. How the threat would be handled if such a monster headed this way is a good question, perhaps even a justification for the thousands of hours and significant funds invested in the exploration of a few dead trees in Siberia. If nothing else, Tunguska, the mystery that's kept scientists guessing for almost a century, has been our warning. Agent Scully delved further back into history in X-File 4X1302029, code name Never Again. Fourteen to sixteen people were jammed into each tiny, waterless, powerless hut. Some had no hut at all. Not even the surrounding jungle could provide shelter, as it teemed with wildlife the temple's membership had no defenses against. Jones had effectively isolated them from any aid, and those running Jonestown weren't about to let any more information reach the public. The Ryan party never made it back to their plane. They were massacred on the runway. When a full detachment of Guyanan troops and yet another American team landed on the 20th, there were few left to save. Those who had survived, most in deep shock, told of suicide and murder. Though it took weeks to sort through everything and every one from the Jonestown commune, the numbers were appalling. Some 200 people had voluntarily swallowed potassium cyanide, as well as a multitude of prescription tranquilizers and narcotics all dissolved in orange drink crystals. Witnesses reported that hundreds more, especially children, had the drink forced on them. When submission came too slowly, the temple's leaders used some of the nearly forty weapons stashed around the compound to force obedience. If that wasn't sufficient inducement, the stragglers were shot where they stood. Coroner's reports eventually accounted for 917 victims, over 600 of which died from beatings or gunshot wounds. Among those dead was Jim Jones, member of the American Communist Party, avowed Marxist, personal owner of some five million dollars, controller of another fifteen million dollars, and, in his later days, firm believer in the fact that he was Lenin. He had a bullet in his head. His dying words are reported to have been, Mother, Mother. Still, the disaster at Jonestown was, in many ways, a unique situation for law enforcement. Certainly there were, and are, militant churches throughout the United States, but until Jim Jones spurred his followers to their deaths, no one really knew the power wielded by a charismatic religious leader. There was, however, no excuse when BATF and FBI agents surrounded another commune just outside Waco, Texas. Once again, they confronted a religious compound known to be heavily armed. Once again, the followers had clearly chosen to ignore the social dictates which might have weakened the commitment of any common criminals who found themselves under siege, and once again they faced a charismatic religious leader. This time it was David Koresh. This time his followers weren't trying to run away. Instead, they dug in deep and hard defying the federal agents camped outside their doors to take on the power of prophecy. And, unlike Jim Jones's fly-by-night ministry, the Branch Davidians had a long history binding them together. Long before David Koresh, who, like the fictional Ephesian, was also originally named Vernon, arrived on the scene, the Davidians had been led by several inspired, if totalitarian, visionaries. In 1929, Victor Hotef, who claimed his church, the Seventh-day Adventists, was too soft, too lenient, gathered together a group of hardcore supporters and broke away to form the Davidian Adventists. Leaning strongly towards an apocalyptic interpretation of biblical literature, Hotef strictly enforced theological and personal discipline within the ranks of his new church. Punishment came quickly and severely within the membership. But in many ways, the Davidian Adventists made little impact on those around them, withdrawing even further from public awareness when Hotef bought a 189-acre ranch just outside Waco, called it Mount Carmel, and retreated inside with his faithful. The site attracted a steady but small number of new adherents as time passed, but when Hotef died in 1955, little had changed in the new sect's first 25 years. Wife Florence, who inherited her husband's ministry, made changes. 
Within two years of burying her husband, Florence sold off the first estate to buy a new, bigger location on the other side of town. It, too, was called Mount Carmel, but Florence Hotef began subtly altering the text of the Davidian Adventist's message. It seems Florence fancied herself as a prophetess. Looking into the future for her followers, she predicted the apocalypse wasn't just near, it was imminent. According to her insights and beliefs, the beginning of the end would come in April or May of 1959. As the spring days of 1959 passed peacefully, Vernon Howell, later David Korish, was born, Lois and Ben Rodden eased the tottering Florence out of her leadership, and as the world failed to disappear in fire and brimstone, a significant number of Davidian Adventists lost their faith and walked away from Mount Carmel. With old Florence safely out of the way and unlikely to return from her semi-enforced religious seclusion, the Roddens quickly set about reviving their flagging church. Now known as the Branch Davidians, the church became an active recruiter of young people, wealthy people, and people in positions of influence. Under Lois and Ben's careful tending, the church shed some of its previous associations with apocalyptic theology, returning to a slightly more conventional path a path that would eventually cross that of Vernon Howell. Ben Rodden died in 1981. Thirty-year-old Vernon Howell arrived in 1985 and wasted no time striking up a sexual relationship with Ben's then 67-year-old widow. The Rodden's son, George, made no uproar about his mother's new partner until after her death in 1986, the young upstart, now known as David Koresh, claimed leadership of the church for himself instead of allowing George, the patient princeling in waiting, to step into his mother's shoes. Though few clear-cut records of this tumultuous period were made, the infighting was said to be vicious, and ended with George Rodden in a mental institution, and David Koresh with undisputed leadership of the Branch Davidian. Now things changed quickly. Like the field where I died's Vernon Ephesian, David Koresh believed in polygamy. In addition to his affair with Lois, Korish took his first wife, Rachel, only fourteen at the time, in 1984. Rachel was pregnant before she turned fifteen. Shortly after Lois's death, he married Rachel's younger sister, twelve-year-old Michelle. It was these two marriages that would start the investigation in child sexual abuse among the Davidians. He married three more times in the next year, each time to a woman less than half his own young age. In 1989, inspired by visions and the Book of Revelations, Koresh ordered all members of the sect to become celibate, all members except himself, as God's chosen one and his chosen wives. Like Vernon Ephesian, Koresh never allowed the commune's children to leave. Instead, David Koresh insisted the children be raised in the commune. Each of his wives was to participate in the rearing of all his children, children he too called the children of God. He stressed the Branch Davidian's need for self-sufficiency, and, quoting as needed from botched versions of Revelations and the Book of Daniel, unsurprising favorites among those prophets who fancy an explosive end to the world, urged the group to stockpile weapons to be used as their defense against the unbelievers when the Day of Judgment arrived. Koresh also began preaching a philosophy of armed resistance to any and all authorities, other than himself. Claiming divine knowledge, Korish exempted himself from the authority and decisions of those without his unique insight. Like Jones and like Ephesian, Korish severed his community's ties to the outside world, threatening and physically abusing those who would attempt to leave. On February 28, 1993, after numerous tip-offs, BATF agents tried to force their way onto the Davidian compound. The Davidians, answering their leader's call to acknowledge no outside authority, desperately fought off what they considered an invasion. In the process, four of the twenty-six BATF agents died, six Davidians died, and nearly a dozen others sustained gunshot wounds. In the end, the BATF agents were still outside, and the Davidians were even more strongly united in their belief that the government was the enemy. The FBI was called in, and the situation in many ways went from bad to worse. In the investigation that was to follow, several items became clear. A virtual turf war raged between the BATF agents who'd originally targeted the Waco compound and the FBI agents called in to assist. 
even among the FBI agents, two distinct groups, the negotiators and the rescue team, formed and continued to work against one another's efforts throughout the standoff. On the night after the negotiators had arranged the release of a number of women and children, the rescue team, a tactics unit, rewarded the Davidians for their cooperation by blaring rock music into the compound all night, despite complaints from both groups, no one stepped in to enforce an action plan. The new Attorney General, Janet Reno, who wasn't even in office when the BATF assault failed, was fed misleading information about baby beaters. Reno, known for her previous stands on children's issues, had just arrived in Washington and had, as yet, absolutely no independent hierarchy of information by which to judge the situation. When Reno asked about the risks posed by the CS gas, proposed as an agent to soften the Waco target, Reno once again received incomplete, if not outright false, information. She was not informed of the risk the gas posed to the children, or to the pregnant women inside the compound. The Davidians, however, probably did know, and knowing, would have interpreted the softening tactics much differently than Reno. On the morning of April 19, 1993, an all-out assault was launched on the Davidians. When the smoke and gas cleared, the compound and its previously hidden bunkers were covered in bodies. Everyone, including twelve of Koresh's children and his wives, two of whom were pregnant, and David Koresh himself, was dead. With such a damning history, a history recreated from the bright orange drink carrying the Ephesians' poison to the claustrophobically insular nature of the compounds, to the presence of hidden bunkers during the field where I died. It wouldn't have taken any paranormal ability to predict the outcome at the Temple of the Seven Stars. When Stephen Hawking talks about time, it's not generally on a scale most of us could understand. He speaks of the birth of universes as casually as most people of their latest niece or nephew, and of time as a semi-solid construct which might have dimensions, or even corners. Without a doubt, he sees the world a little differently than the rest of us. So when he reverses his own previous theories about life, the universe, and everything, people sort of sit up and take notice, especially when what he's saying is that time travel just might, theoretically, be possible. Not that the impossibility of time travel bothered writers. Science fiction has been playing with the edges of science, even anticipating it for nearly a century. Of course, the best of science fiction veered towards the science and less towards the fiction for its plots. The biggest problem for those writing about time travel and science was deciding which model they'd incorporate into their fiction. Einstein probably had no idea that his E equals MC squared would throw writers into such a tizzy, or that it would interfere with one of science fiction's favorite notions, namely, faster than light, FTL, travel. Basically, the theory, along with its cousin, the theory of special relativity, says that things gain mass as they move closer to the speed of light. So the faster something moves, the more mass it gains, until eventually there comes a point at which there isn't enough energy to displace that much mass that fast. Therefore, FTL travel isn't possible. And what does FTL travel have to do with time travel? Well, the mathematicians and physicists who like to play with impossibilities have crunched the numbers and determined that, relatively speaking, if you were traveling faster than light, time would move at a different speed than it does at less than light speed. If you were to stop traveling, you would have moved through a different amount of time than the people you'd left behind. Therefore, you'd be in a different time, which technically is time travel. When most of us think about time travel, however, we think in terms of a single time stream, with events as points along a timeline, points we could visit at will. However, because of the mass-energy-speed problem, it seems that Einstein's relative universe precludes that whole notion. Then along came quantum physics, which portrayed the universe in slightly different terms. Instead of a single stream of events, quantum physics allows a multitude of possible results possible timelines. Uh, for example, in one possibility, a person waits for the walk sign, crosses safely, then keeps on walking home. Oh, then, of course, there's the opposite possibility. The person anticipates the walk sign, doesn't quite make the far curb, 
is nailed by a pizza delivery van and never gets home. Two possibilities. Both are equally possible in the second before the person decides to wait or race the light. Quantum physics suggests that both possibilities continue to exist even after the decision is made. We only see the possibility in our time stream, but somewhere, in some other timeline, the person does indeed die. The program Sliders is based on this premise, and so far, there's little proof that there aren't millions of timelines running alongside our own. The trick, of course, is to get from one stream to the other. Fiction has found a dozen ways around that, naturally occurring and man-made, but science hasn't been that successful. Luckily, for those who want to keep some science in their science fiction, there is a way to overcome both the relativistic and the quantum limitations. Einstein's theory didn't just give us a nifty formula and some useful additions. It also predicted the fact that light will bend in the presence of gravity, that black holes act as they do, and that space isn't flat or smooth. Under specific circumstances, space can be bent, twisted, and turned back on itself. Time, which is after all a function of space, can therefore also be bent, twisted, and turned back on itself. What that effectively does is bring two points of time, two separate events, closer together. All that's required then is the energy to move from point to point, and by a rather ironic twist in Einstein's numbers, it doesn't have to be a lot of energy, as long as it's only used for a short time. Now, with time the issue, and not some impossible-to-obtain amount of energy, quantum physics can come back into play. The neat thing about the two models is that they aren't mutually exclusive, and quantum physics deals in such small increments of time that for all intents and purposes, two events can happen simultaneously, and that's about as short a time interval as even Einstein's equations could demand. So, when Stephen Hawking starts talking about tachyons, particles that are suspected of traveling faster than the speed of light, backwards in time, and wormholes and time loops, the foundation has already been laid. And, at least theoretically, time travel can remain within the bounds of the good science that makes good science fiction. In X-File 4X1803-2397, codename Max, Scully and Mulder appear to be investigating a case of alien abduction. Max Fennig is dead. But questions remain. Why did his flight fall out of the sky? What was he carrying that left radioactive burns on both him and his seatmate? Why was a military air traffic controller asked to lie? Why is that controller's duty partner dead, and perhaps most important of all, what happened in the nine minutes that are still unaccounted for? Max Fennig, according to Mulder's interpretation of events, was plucked from the pressure-sealed cabin of a full-size commercial airliner that just happened to be traveling at 30,000 feet. Believe it or not, that's not even considered all that unusual a scenario by any number of UFO investigators who claim that some thousand people are taken and given back each year, many under equally outrageous conditions. Larry Porter recalls the bizarre case of a Cincinnati man who'd actually moved to the urban center in a bid to avoid alien notice as he suspected he'd already been temporarily removed from his Ohio farmstead several times, Clinton Baker was hoping he'd go a little more unnoticed with more neighbors close by. It doesn't seem to have worked. On May 12, 1996, Baker contacted Porter, who'd taken his previous abduction reports from a gas station phone booth on the outskirts of one of the Cincinnati bedroom suburbs. Porter after getting an address from his highly agitated acquaintance, headed for the phone booth and discovered Baker completely naked and covered in red mud, crouching in the bottom of the glass unit. While delivering Baker back to his new apartment some three miles distant, Porter prodded him for an account of his actions that evening and was told, I ran the tub and was just about to get in when I, I woke up with a blinding headache in the phone booth. Porter was the only person Baker knew in Cincinnati and the first person he'd called. Back in Baker's new apartment, Porter discovered a bathtub full of water that had already cooled to room temperature and a pile of discarded clothes, but no sign of an alien invasion. 
while it is possible that a six-foot-three-inch naked man could walk the three miles from the apartment building to the phone booth, and it's possible that he could do it without being noticed, and it's possible that he could have left his security building without setting off an alarm on the side door, one thing is guaranteed, according to the building's lobby camera. Not a single naked man, or a clothed Clinton baker, for that matter, passed out through after he arrived home from a grocery expedition at three o'clock that afternoon. When Laney Crane of Seattle awoke from a dream peopled with height-impaired green men, she was even more startled to discover she'd been lying on the roof of her new bungalow in February, long enough to accumulate a light dusting of snow over her pajamas— Afraid not only of heights, but of the very real possibility of sliding off the roof of her house, Ms. Crane decided that shouting for help as opposed to skittering across the expanse of slippery shingles was the better part of valor, and set up a commotion loud enough to awaken her next-door neighbor in fairly short order. Perhaps not surprisingly, Laney Crane wasn't paying much attention to snow tracks as she was helped shivering off her roof but her neighbor wasted no time in asking just how she'd managed to get up there without leaving any tracks anywhere around the house. Putting it down to sleepwalking and enough snow to cover whatever tracks she might have made in her nocturnal wanderings, an embarrassed Mrs. Crane thanked her neighbor and retreated to the warmth of her house. It was only in the morning that she realized that none of her windows opened onto the roof, and there wasn't so much as a trellis or tree that could have given her access to the roof, and, most importantly, that she didn't own a ladder. Her neighbor had brought his own on his rescue call. The long-distance winner, however, is undoubtedly Robert Askin. Mr. Askin left his Boston offices at his usual time, 6.05, on a Friday evening, and headed off down the coast to meet his family at their summer home on Cape Cod for the weekend. He didn't arrive, and his wife quickly notified the police. When he was found at 3.35 a.m. without the car that would later turn up in Oklahoma, he was in Buffalo. While it's possible to drive that distance in the time available to him, police were naturally confused as to how he'd managed to ditch the car several states away, and still arrive in Buffalo the following morning. Suggestions that Askin had been intent on deserting his wife and children, and that an accomplice had taken the car to confuse the trail, just didn't pan out. Askin had been seen, still in his car, just outside Hyannisport, by a gas pump attendant who knew the man well. A credit card receipt confirmed the time and location, making it almost impossible for him to even get to Buffalo, much less make secret tryst with accomplices along the way. For his part, Robert Askin maintains he has no memory of anything between the gas station and the street where he was found wandering in Buffalo. Most people who awaken with dim memories of another place, a place with a bright light, find themselves exactly where they were to begin with, and with little more than a vague sense of having lost time between one action and the next. Alicia Taylor reported just such an incident to her local UFO chapter. But her story had a twist. A complete technophobe, Alicia was the classic can't-even-set-the-VCR type. In fact, that's exactly what she was doing when she lost time. She clearly remembers looking at her wristwatch, noting the time as 10.22 p.m., and then looking up to adjust the time on her VCR. It was still blinking that annoying 12 o'clock when she suddenly found herself just staring at the machine, looking back down to her watch to continue to set the clock. She was shocked to see it was now 12.12. 12. A quick glance at the television confirmed that the evening news, which had been airing when she started the whole process, had been over for some time. Thinking she might have had some sort of seizure, which might also explain the horrid taste in her mouth, Ms. Taylor made an appointment with her doctor for the following day. But despite a battery of unpleasant tests, no medical explanation for the missing hour and fifty minutes was ever found. Concepcion Guerrez never actually noticed her blank times until one evening, when she thought she was home helping her daughter with her homework, she discovered herself walking along a street two blocks away. The realization that she wasn't where she was supposed to be was so startling and disorienting that she spun about on her heel to race home and immediately stepped out in front of a car. In addition to Concepcion's statement, which the recording officer noted seemed muddled, was the equally unusual sworn testimony of the driver. He didn't claim that he simply didn't see her, as hundreds of drivers in similar situations have done. He claimed 
she wasn't there. According to the police report, there were no cars parked along the street to impair the driver's view. This was a new housing area, and consequently, there were no tree-lined avenues that might create visual blocks. Though no one believed either of them, and there was no evidence to contradict their stories, one thing remains true. The only two eyewitnesses to the event, Concepcion and the driver, both agree she just appeared on the sidewalk. When questioned, Concepcion's daughter, who just started kindergarten that year, reportedly said, she just disappeared, so I went to bed. Concepcion's sense of otherworldliness only increased when her bemused husband confirmed the fact that his wife had been disappearing at odd intervals ever since they were married. Why hadn't he said anything? Because, well, I loved her, and if she wasn't ready to talk about it, I wasn't going to force her. Concepcion Guerrez is probably the only wife on the planet who could wish for a slightly less understanding husband. Most abductees, even fictional ones like the adorable Max Fennig, however, are all too aware of their disappearances. Tyrell Cobb could certainly identify with the character. He, too, believes he'd been taken dozens of times, and his memory of several of those occasions is all too clear. In 1987, he checked himself into a mental institution and asked them to watch him while he slept to make sure he was there the whole time. While voluntary inmates are usually allowed considerably more freedom than other patients, something about Tyrell Cobb made at least one of his doctors uncomfortable enough to have him assigned to one of the suicide watch rooms, which was equipped with close-circuit cameras that recorded the activity within the room for an eight-hour stretch and fed a live image back to a nurse's station. A wall of glass also provided staff with first-hand images of anything happening in the rooms, and Tyrell Cobb had no objection to leaving the privacy curtains wide open. After what he called his first decent night's sleep in two years, Cobb sat down with two psychiatrists and proceeded to tell them his story. Though he had no physical proof, he claimed to have been the subject of numerous alien experiments, that he'd been subjected to mind-numbing drugs which resulted in his losing days from his memory, and that he was sure they would be back to finish the job. Needless to say, he was immediately tested for a number of drugs, mind-numbing and otherwise. Though, on the downside for Cobb, the tests failed to turn up any unusual chemicals in his system. They also proved that he wasn't some whacked-out addict who'd imagined the whole thing in a drugged stupor. He remained at the hospital for eight days, and though he never physically disappeared, he registered some highly unusual readings on two separate EEG scans. Further investigation into those results revealed no underlying causality. In other words, no one could explain the smooth brain wave patterns Cobb registered for periods as long as 32 minutes at a time. And it looks like Cobb will continue to be something of a mystery. When he checked himself out on the eighth day, he reported back to his job at a local hotel, completed his shift, walked out the front door, and disappeared. No one has seen him since November of 1987. The case of Max Fennig continued in X-File 4X1703-1697, codenamed Tempus Fugit, when Mulder and Scully are shocked to discover that the victims of a commercial airline crash included well-known alien abductee Max Fennig, and that Fennig had predicted the crash. When investigators began turning up anomalous evidence, including the suspicious absence of any wristwatches among the bodies... Mulder starts to suspect that Flight 549 wasn't the only aircraft in the sky that night. In fact, he thinks there's a reasonable balance of probability that Max was sucked from the aircraft by an alien force. I know you won't believe me. That's the opening line Dr. Lynn Hauser has heard over 500 times since deciding to turn her general practice psychiatry office into a special clinic for those who sincerely believe they're victims of alien abductions, assaults, and even rapes. It's difficult for the general public to understand the stress level these patients live with. If I could compare it to anything, it would probably be to the post-traumatic stress syndrome most often encountered in war veterans, especially those who returned from active tours of duty to discover folks back home had a vastly different view of the war than they did. The group of patients meeting in the conference room for their weekly encounter sessions all have one thing in common. They look perfectly normal. 
My patients aren't crazy. They don't go around like that chess player with tin foil wrapped around his head to keep out the voices. Now, most of them live what we might call perfectly adjusted lives, with the small exception that they believe they were kidnapped by something alien. Carla G., an accounting clerk and mother of two, certainly wouldn't draw any attention in an elevator, but according to Dr. Hauser, is the highest-rate repeater in the group. She recalls incidents that go well back into her childhood. Some memories are tied to events we know to have taken place when she was only four or five years old. What sort of incidents? Fairly classic abduction scenarios. A feeling of paralyzation, bright lights, blackouts, pain, some vague memories of short figures poking her frozen form with long fingers, more pain, more blackness. Then the realization she was not where she went to sleep. The rest of the group arrived promptly, none of them sporting clothes with bizarre slogans or green hair or anything else out of the ordinary. In total, twelve patients have joined the discussion this evening. Two are auto mechanics, two are confidential secretaries with highly responsible and independent positions. One is a doctor, three work at a local canning operation, one is a priest. They sit quietly, attentive to one another's questions and comments. Occasionally, some item will start a round of nodding, as they all seem to relate to a particular detail in the narration. When Dr. Hauser suggests some psychological models that might begin to explain their experiences in less exotic ways, the possibility that naturally occurring apnea might account for the light at the end of the tunnel effect, all twelve appear anxious to give her theories serious consideration. A hand rises slowly at the back of the room, and Tina B. leans forward. I can see what you're suggesting. Something similar to a near-death experience, but do you think a person could stop breathing long enough to have an experience like that and still be wide awake? Dr. Hauser looks at her curiously and waits as she continues. I mean, the first thing I can remember being taken away, I was sitting in my car, wide awake, trying to find the gas bill. Like several members of this group, Tina B. is what's known as a repeater. Like the fictional Max Fennig, she believes she's been abducted not once, but many times. Unlike Carla, Tina had a perfectly normal childhood and was twenty-three when her life was turned on its head, and she stopped being sure things were exactly as they appeared. Her question is thoughtful, almost hopeful, but there aren't any firm answers for her tonight. Dr. Hauser makes a note on her pad before answering. I doubt a waking person would suffer from apnea at all. But that's not necessarily true. I can invite a sleep specialist to come in and discuss the pathology involved. Or, if you prefer, I can make individual referrals. Someone quickly opts for the private referral, and several of the group follow the lead. Dr. Hauser's pencil is flying across her notepad after the meeting. She explains that because so many abduction scenarios occur at night, some psychologists believe the answer to these people's profound belief in alien abduction lies in their sleep habits. We've all experienced vivid dreams from time to time, the ones that make you get out of bed and turn on the light. Some sleep disorders can actually intensify the dreaming process, making it seem as real as any waking experience. If you were to combine that condition with something like apnea, it's possible that the result would be the alien abduction experience. So Dr. Hauser herself doesn't believe in the literal truth of her patient's stories. A long pause follows. When I started interviewing abductees, I was certain that some common pathology, some common experience would make itself evident during the course of treatments. I wasn't the type of person to believe in UFOs and aliens. I'm still not. What I am, though, is thoroughly impressed by the consistencies I hear in these people's statements. It was just that that very quality attracted me to the phenomenon, but I hadn't realized what a compelling picture their stories would present me with. Oh, it's not the big things that catch you. You expect that. The whole bright place experience is actually common in a few other fields of investigation as well. No, it's the details. One of the first women who came to the clinic, a Joanne G., related a rather precise event from one of her experiences. 
She told me about a cramp developing in her leg because she was just a tad taller than the table she'd been laid on. The cold metal edge pressing into her calf gave her a vicious charley horse. Then she told me how one of the aliens had massaged the cramp away with a warm cloth that seemed almost like a tiny electric blanket. Now, just two months ago, a male subject presented with an identical story, except the cramp was an inch or two above the back of his knee, a location consistent with Joanne's if you make allowance for height differences. Her chuckle seems a little strained. On days like that, I really wonder if our psyches can possibly be that primed for identical dream experiences, or if maybe the simplest solution to the whole abductee phenomenon isn't that their experiences are all the same because they're all true. She looks up again. But that's only on a very few days. Most of the time I feel like I'm just inches away from discovering some logical way of putting it all together, of finding a real, tangible, scientific reason why some 400 people each year have experiences like this. In the absence of physical proof that aliens are borrowing human beings, the only evidence that abductions might be happening at all is in the memories of the abductees. It's that sense of conviction, their complete confidence in their own memories that often prevents them from accepting even the possibility that what they remember might not have happened exactly as they recall. In my opinion, my job as a therapist isn't to decide if what they believe happened to them was objectively real. No, my job is to help them function in the real world. If I was treating Carla for arachnophobia, for example, I'd have two ways to approach the problem. I could take the position that her fear stemmed from some incident or incidents, something she might or might not actually even remember or even associate with her fear of spiders, and try to eliminate the root of her fear. Or I might just accept that the fear exists and help her find ways to cope with it. The choice of approach and treatment would depend on a number of factors, including the patient's stated objective and the style of therapy I practiced. So, uh, are the majority of your patients looking for affirmation that what they experienced was real, or uh, are they just trying to cope with the experience and move on? Most, I think, are are looking for a good reason to doubt themselves. Yeah, that sounds rather sad. Well, in a sense, it is. No therapist would suggest a patient simply attempt to amputate an experience that has undoubtedly shaped a considerable proportion of their views and, and beliefs. Now, what we're trying to do here is integrate those memories and give these patients a way to cope on a day-to-day -day basis. You remember those Vietnam vets I was talking about? Well, I can't make the war unhappen for them. What I can do is give them coping mechanisms that allow them to relate and a place where they can discuss their problems with people who understand. So if Max Fennig were a real person and he were to walk in here tomorrow, what would you do for him? What could you do for them? Well, in all honesty, not much. There is a certain percentage of abductees who can't just cope. Like the man in your tape, they're driven to find explanations for what happened to them or, or what they believed happened. What they're looking for isn't affirmation. They know they don't need me or you to agree with them. They aren't trying to make their perspective match in with the rest of those around them. Now, they're, they're looking for something solid, something they can point to and say without doubt, there is the proof. Oh, what if that proves impossible? I mean, do these driven individuals eventually give up? Well, not in my experience. Okay, so what happens to them? Well, let me give you another scenario. Suppose you're a ten-year-old boy who's just gotten his first puppy. You know you're responsible for his care, and in general you're diligent in your chores, and then one night, as you fall asleep, you realize you forgot to put down fresh water before going to bed. Now, that's real, a fact. You drift off anyway and dream that your dog died. You wake up with your heart pounding, tears running down your face, and a very real sense of horror and grief. Your body responds as if the dog had really died, and so, to a great extent, does your heart and your mind. So you race downstairs and water the dog. Now, tell me, does it really matter if the dream was a dream? Your actions from that point on are likely to reflect the fact that you've learned what a responsibility it is to be the one caring for that helpless puppy. The dog didn't actually have to die for you to learn from the experience. 
It didn't have to die to change your view of the world or how you would react to that world. That's why I don't try to judge how real my patients' experiences have been and why some of them will never be able to believe they weren't abducted. In X-File 4X02102279, not all scotographs, however, are tree mold that mysteriously forms itself into images of the Virgin Mary or piles of refuse at a landfill site that, if viewed just so, might, by those with good imaginations, resemble the final scene from your child's Christmas play, complete with shepherds. Now, most scotographs are even more amorphous. In December of 1994, Dana Plack of Detroit took home her latest batch of photographs and was busily grinning over the captured antics of the family's two-year-old daughter, when one photo literally left her speechless. Wordlessly handing over the picture to her husband, she pointed to what appeared to be a shadowy death, complete with billowing robes and sickle leaning over the toddler. Both parents were shaken, and asked a photographer friend to see what he made of the print. Their relief when he duplicated the picture with the assistance of a conveniently placed plant hanger and the afternoon sunlight streaming through an equally convenient window was considerable. No one, however, was able to do the same for Gordon and Lydia Totten of Toronto when their holiday pictures unexpectedly revealed a ghostly aura surrounding Lydia's mother, though several experts did try. The confounding factors in this case were highly technical. While not every picture on the roll included Lydia's mother, not one picture of her was without the aura. The affected pictures didn't follow a pattern, as might be found, if the film had been accidentally exposed. The camera, examined by the manufacturer on two separate occasions, functioned perfectly under stringent test conditions. Still, despite the lack of evidence to support any sort of theory, several photographers suggested there might have been a problem with the film before it was loaded into the camera. The incident will likely retain its mystery, at least for the Totten family, if only because the question photos turned out to be the last taken of the 83-year-old woman who died of natural causes within the week. Like scotography, thought photography's perceived validity, or lack thereof, often depends on the ability to judge the technical components of the setup, the controls placed on experimental settings, the interpretation of the images, if any, collected, and the procedure undertaken by the photographer. In other words, a situation more perfectly designed for integration into an X-Files episode would be hard to find. Scully's healthy skepticism for photos taken outside a controlled environment with outdated and overheated film accurately reflects the general feeling within the limited scientific world actually studying photographs. Mulder's open-minded stance, however, also turns up among researchers, even those with considerably less detailed pictures than the one Mulder discovered. Ted Sirios, the bellhop Mulder mentions to Scully, was probably the first photographer to gain widespread notoriety. Born in 1920, Sirios was the prima donna study subject of Dr. Jewel Eisenbud and a group of parapsychologists who spent several years testing his ability. Sirios' early images were detailed, and even to a skeptical interpreter, likely to bear some resemblance to whatever image he claimed he intended to record. Some images of recognizable locations and famous people were unquestionable, if blurry or distorted. Later images became less and less detailed, some no more than blobs which Ted Sirios dubbed blackies and whiteys. In 1967, Eisenberg published a book, The World of Ted Sirios, which included dozens of photographs. Ironically, it was these photographs which themselves would later be considered proof that Ted Sirios had been creating his pictures not with his mind, but with a palmable handheld device capable of altering the film inside the camera casing. Though Eisenbud continued to support the integrity of the images, hoaxbusters like James Randi weakened the evidence considerably by duplicating Sirio's images with their own sleight-of-hand technologies. Another American photographer, supposedly subjected to rigorous study, was Stella Lansing of Michigan. Unlike Sirios, who specialized in photographic expressions of his psychic talents, Lansing brought a remarkable history to her new skill photography. Moving furniture, the knocking of poltergeists, and the appearance of ghostly apparitions were familiar events. Her investigator, Dr. Berthold Schwartz, 
confined his inquiries to the images she produced on Polaroid films, but despite narrowing the field of research and spending several years on the problem, never produced anything even approximating an explanation for the phenomena. Of course, the subjects themselves, the human element, often confound the investigative process even further. Ted Sirios, for example, demands he work through a black box he called his gizmo. Although the box examined many times seems perfectly innocuous, its presence in an otherwise controlled experimental setup breeds mistrust and skepticism. Another photographer, Willie Schwanholtz, makes studying his technique difficult by insisting he bounce the camera off his forehead to create his images. Masuki Kiyota, who came to prominence during the 70s, felt a strong need to physically handle the film packs before attempting to imprint images. Somehow it's easier to accept that Maria Protaccia can't perform her violin solos before packed houses without wearing her mother's locket, a well-documented fact, than to accept that these photograph impresarios can't create without their own idiosyncratic aids especially in cases like Masuki Kiyota, coincidentally another of Dr. Jewel Eisenbud's protégés, who is reputed to have been caught on film himself while in the process of hoaxing yet another talent, spoon-bending. Passing off all psychic photography as nothing more than a new game for hoaxers and investigators to play somewhere on the edges of real science, however, would be as scientifically unsound as simply accepting the claims of every kook with a camera. Some psychic photographers, like Ren Hope, an English medium, and the first documented case involving the mysterious images some fifty years ago, were studied under incredibly rigorous conditions that might even have satisfied Scully. Hope had no prior contact with the films, didn't physically handle the cameras, and was provided with either verbal descriptions of the images to create, or with ordinary photographs, just moments to commencing the tests. While he never achieved results as spectacular as Sirio's early efforts, the results were, more importantly, from a scientific standpoint, consistent from the beginning of the study to the end, when the investigators reluctantly admitted they could find no source other than Hope himself that could account for the images. James Cornell, Patricia Speck, Nio Cleary and Benjamin Dobbs are all photographers who not only provided images on demand, under conditions Sirios and the others would have described as trying, but who have never been involved in performances for a non-scientific audience. Neither have they ever garnered 